Good morning. This is the August 19th Gary Sansing Public Forum. Uh, the, gov the Gary Sansing Public Forum is intended for uh, matters not included on the agenda for the upcoming Board of County Commissioners meeting. Citizens wishing to address items on the agenda should sign up to speak to such an item at the regular Board of County Commissioners meeting. Speakers shall refrain from abusive or profane remarks, disruptive outbursts, protests, or other conduct which interferes with the orderly conduct of the Gary Sansing Public Forum. Uh, do the number of speakers, we are just going to have to go down to two minutes. Um, uh, and then uh, to allow sufficient time for all speakers. Um, also, please turn your cell phone to the vibrate, silence, or off setting. Uh, our first speaker is Michelle Tyler. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and to speak. I've been here before, and I always appreciate the opportunity to come before all of you, especially my county commissioner. Um, so thank you again. Um, you guys know why I'm here. I'm here because of a tree. Um, there's a bigger issue behind the tree. Um, so, but I'm going to start with the tree. So the tree is obviously very important to not only the people of District 3, but the people across the Scambia County, across the Panhandle. This has been picked up in Santa Rosa. It's been picked up in Milton Cantonment. Um, I did want to go ahead and give this to you if you'll take it, Mr. May. Um, this is a copy of the signatures on the petition that has been going around since Sunday and the comments left by those who have signed the petition who are unable to be here today. As of currently, this petition has 2,290 signatures on it, which we've collected just since Sunday. It's been less than a week. Uh, so there's been some question, you know, concerning the age of this tree, concerning whether or not we should take it down. The bottom line is that LDC is weak and it's oftentimes unenforced, short of setting a guide for how much more money has to be paid to cut down a heritage tree versus a smaller tree. It's not being used to preserve anything. If it was, the county would stop being hit with multiple appeals against DOs that garner huge public opposition and go against important environmental concern or potential negative environmental impact. It seems to be regardless of whether it's the public or an expert that comes and speaks before you or a DRC meeting or on approving a DO. Either way, we approve the removal every time. We do not use the vague language in our LDC to actually preserve anything. We just use it as a gauge whether or not it's okay to get rid of it and how much that will cost. Most of the general citizen pool here will tell you that these DRC meetings that are open to public input at planning and zoning seem to just simply be a formality. Um, you know, again, we, we took away concurrency. It doesn't matter that there's magic, you know, a, a massive public outcry that we want concurrency back. That's what gives us as communities grounds to dispute how we want our communities to be, what we want to preserve in them, where we want to develop, how we want to develop. Again, we have CRA plans. There's no overlay in LDC. Every avenue that citizens have to protect our communities we have no say so in how that applies to land development code. So these issues continue to arise and we continue to be here. So again, I just wanted to bring this before you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I'm not really sure who to give these to, but I want to make sure, sure that someone has them. Margaret Hostetter. Thank Margaret Hostetter, 1500 Dogwood Place. I have provided a flyer which is on your desks and we have all of the information about this effort on the Facebook group Trees of Escambia County, Florida. I'm here today literally putting my life and many of our uh, wonderful friends here who are here to support protection of this tree, literally putting our lives at risk, coming out in the hottest time we've known of COVID, to appeal and plea to you all to save the A-plus storage heritage oak tree. The tree ordinance requires that this tree be saved. And we are here also because trees have no voice and we're, we're being their voice and you are the decision makers as to who you're going to listen to. 
your own ordinance, the voices of the people that come and believe and speak for the trees who cannot speak for themselves, or the developers and those who get this kind of special treatment where a tree that meets all the criteria as a protected tree, a heritage oak tree, not only a heritage oak tree, but the largest known and measured heritage oak tree this county has ever had, 85 inches in diameter. And if that tree is put on the chopping block and destroyed, there's no hope. There's no ordinance here that will protect anything. Some of us here have medical conditions that are so serious, the doctors had advised we not go out in public. Others are here who have not been able to be vaccinated because they're children under 12 or because they are immunocompromised. They're literally here putting their lives on the line. And you all aren't even looking at us while we're talking. Uh, this is very disappointing. One question I have you, is for Director Jones. Thank you. Oh, I, the timer was not working? It doesn't beep. It worked. It went off. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Thank you very much for overturning Director Jones. Go ahead, Margaret. Mar 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 I'll give you 10 seconds. Next question. 10 seconds, though, Margaret, please. Ask question. You said you had a question for Director Jones. Ask your question. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. My you question. said I wouldn't listen. I was listening. Maybe, yeah. Okay, I, when, I, when people listen, I, I think they should Mark, be looking, 10 but thank you, sir. The question for Horace Director Jones is, why did you override the decision and the recommendation of the professionals in your department that would require this tree be spared and the developer would have to modify the size of his development in keeping with the land development code and preserving the tree? Why? Thank you, Margaret. Mar 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 thank you. Harz is going to answer all thank those you, questions sir. after the, all the speakers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We will, Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, please note that question because I'm, I will ask you to answer them when it's over. Kelly Moore. <clears throat> uh, Kelly Moore, 1500 Dogwood Place, now in Lumens District. Um, Good deal. I, I would like to make a comment to every one of the commissioners. This has been thrown on Lumen's back, obviously, because it's in his district. But we as a society vote for each one of y'all as an individual district. But everything y'all vote on affects every district. Yes. Just because it's not in your district, I guarantee you, Jeff, you've got thousands of oak trees in your district, probably hundreds of them close to the size of this one. This is not a Lumen May district issue. This is a land development code. If we don't have rules and laws, why do we do anything? Um, Michelle just said, I think 2290. is what it was at when I asked Okay, it's now 2310. I'm watching it and it goes up every, every few minutes, it goes up a few, a few signatures. Um, I just don't understand why. When you watch the votes and the rules or the, in the, on the issues, why is it it seems like if, if you vote for something in my district, I'll vote for something in your district? That's what we as the public, I believe, think. You don't see three to two votes. Usually it's four to one, and you know who the one always is. Yeah, thank you, Doug. Anyway, I, we want everybody to get along and vote for what's best for us. Not for you, not for your district, but for us as a county. And I don't understand why that's a like a hard thing to do. Um, this tree though, like I said, it's ha it, it owns probably a over a hundred different insects, which feeds birds, animals, raccoons, whatever. The guy could obviously take his plan and re mix it around a little bit and save that tree 100%. He could take out several of the mini storages, they're only eight foot tall, a half a row of one of them, and build the building over on the existing site and use that for the new site for parking for the whole big building. It wouldn't cost him that much. And it would, it would be a great PR move for that person. You know, he could say, I've thought it through and I want to save the tree because it's the oldest we know. Well, it's the largest, probably the oldest also. 
And you know, Pensacola was incorporated in, in 1824, I believe. This tree's probably older than the city from a corporation standpoint. So I know it's not in Pensacola, but Scambia County, Pensacola, whatever. Um, thank you for a little bit of extra time. Appreciate it. Sarah O'Neill. Um, hello, my name is Sarah O'Neill, and I'm not a native um, Pensacolian. Um, my husband's work brought us here, and i um, been very happy um, living in this area, but I think what caught uh, my attention last week, um, I saw on Facebook about this tree and was curious, you know, when I was hearing the information about it, um, pulled it up on the map, um, and I think really what is at stake here is the meaning of words and whether or not we uphold our codes, um, and I think the reason that this is gaining such traction with the public is because there's been a lot of question, you know, what do words mean? When you see the word protected, does that actually mean protected? Or does that mean you can just pay a fine and do what you want to do? Um, when you see, I see a code that, that says that, um, you know, you, you should be able to do other use with it, you know, are you going to follow that? Um, and I'm for, for private property rights for owners, but I, I saw this case, I looked up on Zillow when the, the property had been purchased and it was in January. So this isn't a property that this owner had for a long time and you know, decided to, he wanted to do something with. He purchased it knowing there was a protected oak tree on it. There was actually a residence on it um, that was cleared out you know, to make way for what he wants to do. And he hasn't, the, the owner hasn't even had the approval yet to do, and, and made those decisions. So I think just personally, um, it just shows the attitude that's in the area where developers can purchase a piece of property that so clearly um, you know, has something on it that is protected and they can, can do what they want to do with it. So I think you know, why me as a resident um, is, is watching this so carefully, you know, when there's so many other issues out there right now that you know, take our, you know, our attention, um, is just because this sets a precedence. I mean, if this tree that is so extremely large, you know, there's no question whether or not it's, it's protected, can be cut down, that's on the side of the property where there's plenty of other space around. If, if that's not protected, is there a protected tree in our, our neighborhoods? I mean, what's gonna stop the clear cutting? So I just appreciate your, your attention to this matter. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, no yes. question for the speaker. Yes, Ms. Sarah, if you could, I have a question for you. Um, you did bring up a, a, a different element of it from really what everybody else is saying, so I wanted to get to dive into it a little bit. Um, you had mentioned that this is a, that the individual uh, recently purchased this property and is not a longtime property owner. Yes. Um, in your mind, should the property rights be different for people who have just bought their property as those who say have had it in their family for generations? Well, I know like when I, when I purchase a property, I look at, you know, because we're military and so we're mm -hmm. always, you know, we're moving around and looking at properties and I have to look at, you know, what is there before I make the decision. And if I want to build on a property, um, I would put a contingency in saying, I need to remove this tree, or I need to get approval to remove this tree in order to be able to, to build. I mean, I think he could have, or she could have um, you know, put that in there and had the approval first, and then went through with the yeah. purchase of it. Um, so I think you know, grandfather, being grandfathered in, I mean, I would hope that I think someone who has had the property for a long time would probably appreciate the value of the tree. I mean, the shade it provides. The, the flood mitigation it does. I mean, I, I'm actually curious if the owner who sold the property even knew the tree was gonna be cut down. Because I know if, if this was somebody, you know, that might have been why that wasn't put in the contract. Because they may not have wanted to sell the yeah. land if okay. they would have yeah. known and that. I, I don't wanna, I mean, obviously a lot of great conversation there, but I mean, yeah. from, the, from the point of view of what we have to do, I'm just asking if what you're thinking is that a person should have a different set of real estate rights, property rights, if they just bought a piece of property versus if they've already had it before. No, I think so. there should be the same property okay. rights for Thank both. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. David Bush. Good morning. My name is David Bush, and I live in the city of Pensacola. And I watched them about eight or nine months ago and I even got on a virtual interview because they were locked down uh, over the tree ordinance in the city of Pensacola. And they were looking into one that this lady right here is talking about down on Spring Street. An arborist comes out, oh my goodness, this tree is diseased. It's got to go. Well, 
Another arborist said, no, it's okay, nothing wrong with it. An arborist, you pay $75 to Tallahassee, take a couple courses, and you are an arborist. It's, it's just a matter of applying for it mostly. Anyway, have, I hope you guys, folks, gentlemen, have gone out and looked at where this tree is. I did yesterday. I drove around A Plus's property. They need, this is like a little over half an acre. They, they've got to the moon. The huge, huge operation they have there. If they need more space, go up three, three floors. That's easy. Or protect us somehow. But anyway, this should be saved. And, and uh, I hope you guys, everyone, can go out there and look at this location and this tree. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Uh, Sarah Randolph. Good morning. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say something about the heritage oak tree. So it's Sarah Randolph, 4312 Acacia Drive. Um, the benefit of these trees is well documented. They provide shade and they take up and store carbon, helping us as we struggle with an increasingly hotter planet. Their leaves absorb airborne pollutants. They work to clean up soil and water absorbing excess nutrients and pesticides, and they mitigate soil erosion from storm damage. Plus, they are home to insects, birds, other small animals, and plants. They are our allies. I would also point out that according to our own county code, this particular tree would not qualify for removal. It has protected status. It measures 85 inches across and is perfectly healthy. If it is cut down, it will, in effect, have been sold for $5,950. You can't get all the benefits that I just spoke of for $5,950. And the harm will have been done to the tree and the community, our community. It makes me think of how we vilify the people who run companies that won't stop polluting our air and water because it's cheaper or easier for them just to pay the fine. What's the difference other than that we could stop this before the harm is done. I'm asking you to please reconsider and see what you can do to bring this tree back off of that chopping block. Thank you. Diane Crummel. Escambia County Planning and Developmental Services recently approved the removal of the largest and oldest recorded tree here in Escambia County, estimated to be around 350 years old and 85 inches across. This tree meets all the ideal protection standards here in Escambia County. The fact is that approving removal of this tree actually goes against your own land development code, and there's no reason this tree should be removed. Isn't it true that developers can only develop within the limits of the Escambia County land development code? And according to code, this tree is supposed to be protected? Why do you write these codes when you have no intentions of enforcing them? Could it be that you never intended the LDC to protect this historical majestic tree and other trees for that matter, but instead use it as a means to charge the developer more and fill the coffers of Escambia County? Why does it always have to be about money? Can you tell me one instance where the developer was made to protect a tree and not cut it down? The county is profiting off of these weak and unenforced land development codes when it pertains really to anything environmental especially when it comes to removal of trees. The LDC language needs to be stronger and clear. It is currently weak, not specific, and leaves a lot of wiggle room when developers want to come in and remove trees. The LDC, as written, allows the developmental services to manipulate the code however they see fit to maximize the profit for the county. This is a developer's dream come true. And in, in uh, Doug Underhill, um, in, I want to respond to that. This is from Jarrah Jacquet. He was unable to attend. I am a firm believer in private property rights, but personal liberty is never absolute and must be balanced against the common good. Wanton destruction and poor stewardship of our natural commonwealth hurts the entire community. This particular standoff seems completely unnecessary. The BOCC needs to stand up for the interests of the public and this aspiring mini-mogul 
storage unit needs to renegotiate in good faith with the county to reach a mutually acceptable solution. I have to ask why the citizens of Escambia County weren't informed and allowed public input before the demise of this tree was approved. Escambia County should honor their own land development code and keeping this tree from being cut down. It's not too late to do the right thing and write a plan that saves this tree. Thank you, Diane. Melissa Pino. Thank you, Chairman Bender. Melissa Pino, 413 Southeast Boblets. Um, using the exact same words that I used at the final the other day, gentlemen, the jig is up. And perhaps you didn't realize when you came to office, I doubt you did, a lot of you, because you know, you're coming, you're, you, you, you're, you've been here for a while, that you gentlemen would oversee the future of what this county is gonna look like. Next year, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 50 years, 100 years, what is Escambia County gonna look like when your kids and your grandkids and the kids and grandkids of everybody in this room are looking out over this area, are they gonna look at a hellscape that is the result of the runaway development and the loosey-goosey weasel language land development code? And it's not, you. This, this, a lot of this arose before you came to office. So I get that you guys get plastered for decisions that came before, but at the same time, no one is fooled that you gentlemen don't have any control over this. You're the policymakers of Escambia County. It is time that that LDC, and not only that, our zoning, which got flattened to the benefit of the developers and is doing exactly what they intended it to do. Now, when Commissioner Underhill got written up for code on his own property for violations that I put in for disturbance of land, for running a commercial enterprise on an MDR property, and for um, throwing down rock without a permit, his answer was he didn't know what the land development code was on that, and he stated that up on this dais. Now, when Doug cut down my trees across the street, my neighbors, a couple of them, watched at what he had orchestrated, and I said, why didn't you text me? I was at a meeting, I could have stopped it. I got the texts on this one. Gentlemen, please, do the right thing and set, set the stage for what you want to leave your grandkids. Because if you don't stop this mess soon, what they're going to be looking at, I mean, you know, Pensacola could just fall into the gulf with the drainage problems we've got, and you've got time to fix it and you set the tone, this isn't on staff. They need your support and help to get this thing rewritten in a way that works. And if you get sued from this property owner, you guys are getting sued for a lot worse things. Get sued for the right thing for once. Thank you. Thank you. Please hold your applause. Commissioner Underhill, did you have a... Doug. Yeah, no, I think yeah. it's, a, it's actually an interesting point. I mean, you have a, a person, a candidate running for office talking about putting in a, uh, uh, utilizing essentially uh, militarizing our government codes uh, for her political gain um, to the point that if you put down uh, gravel on your driveway to replace the gravel that was wiped away in Hurricane Sally, that's the kind of thing that the government ought to be uh, you know, getting involved in. So, you know, it's uh, it's kind of noteworthy to see that that's really the direction that we're going. Um, you know, um, don't worry, Margaret. I won't talk about the big code violation you've got on your trailer park coming up. So, I mean, the one that we're <laughs> Brian Wire. Yeah, I mean, everything should be about the community, but you also have to understand that when it becomes like that and it's about political, uh -huh. it makes it very hard for us to find common ground that we can work in. But is everybody that speaks or in the community judged by individually? By thank, thank you, Michelle. Good morning, County Commissioners. Uh, today I have a flyer I just want to hand out for you for our Office Supplier Diversity event. The date is September the 21st. This flyer really talks about the event being in person. Uh, we're going to make a tough decision tomorrow, tomorrow whether to have the event in person or uh, virtually. 
and uh, the decision will most likely be a virtual event and switch over to that. We had 40 tables planned for departments all across the state. We were going to be the first in-person office priority diversity event in the entire state, and our metrics have shown that we were one of the most successful ones in the past, uh, more successful in Orlando, Tallahassee, Miami, with the amount of attendees that came to the event and those who were involved and gave great, gave great ratings. Uh, unfortunately, most likely, we're going to probably push it to virtual um, because of the fact that we're at the COVID numbers. So I just wanted to personally just give you this flyer, and we'll be sending out electronic versions tomorrow after we find out if we're going to be in person or virtually. But I'd love to have your support. I'd love to have you send any kind of your businesses, whether they be big or small, to attend the event, and love to have you guys be there if possible. Um, and I do say with heavy heart, I've been trying to plan this thing for months, and uh, I really wanted to be in person. We received some real pressure uh, uh, statewide because we were hoping to have the governor, lieutenant governor, or secretary of state come here in Pensacola for this event. But uh, we're, the virtual may be a need. I attended a uh, Baptist Hospital Quality Patient Survey meeting this morning, and the stories that I heard this morning, it just changed my whole perspective on the fact that we have to be safe for our community. There's some stories that are being that I, I had some privy to this morning that truly um, truly touch, touch your heart when you, you hear those stories. So I really love to have this be in person. Most likely be virtual, but I would love to have your support. I'd love to have you, if you're available, let me know. I'd love to have you be a, maybe be a speaker or open the event up. Uh, it'd be a great time for our businesses to find ways to get work done across the whole entire state level. Uh, if I can answer any questions for you, please let me know. Commissioner Underhill. Brian, um, you know, we've talked quite a bit about, I was actually planning on being there and talking about the uh, cyber jobs on base. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm personally aware of about 30 positions that are available on mm -hmm. base right now. Um, and uh, of course, in cyber and tech industries, uh, minority represent yeah. representation is historically low. Um, if we, uh, and most of the time when I go to these things, the most I get out of them is the milling about and talking to people, the one-on-one -on -one conversations. Mm -hmm. um, if you go virtual, uh, what would you recommend? Because I was actually, I've got a couple of the companies on base that were, were wanting to just kind of, they didn't really have a plan, but just yeah. to be able to just see what, what is said. Yeah, we'll go, we're going to make that decision tomorrow. Uh, we've been holding out to the last moment because, as you know, in person's way to do it. Our past events, we had great connections, folks from Atlanta, Jacksonville. Uh, New Orleans that drove here for these events in past years. So we'll let you know more details tomorrow once we figure it out. Uh, but it's going to be a matter of just logging in. We're going to have separate group rooms available for if you want to talk to people from Herbert Field and talk to people from NAS, you can go to those rooms and talk to them directly. These are the department heads in charge of all those departments. So I'll definitely give you some more information yeah. once we have the discussion tomorrow. But I truly hate the fact we can't be in person to see each other and talk face to face. Yeah, one of the things that we had talked about quite a bit was that the security clearance issue is, yes. the, uh, is, an, is a barrier to entry for our local kids. And we've actually, you know, I've been talking with my peer group about that. And uh, a lot of the jobs now that exist only require a secret clearance, which, you know, quite frankly, just about anybody who's kept their nose clean can get at low cost. So we were actually looking at, and we were, it's one of those things where when you talk about the, uh, the things that create uh, uh, differences in opportunity, yes, oftentimes we don't even know what they are, right? Mm -hmm. So when we were over classifying positions and requiring a top secret security clearance, when in fact with a modification of the way we do work, it would only require a secret. Um, you know, and then you move all your, it only, it was like it was 90% of tasks were, uh, were secret and yes, then sir. the, and then 10% were top secret and therefore the job had to be top secret. Well, by changing things around, and this is what the industry is really looking at is how do we change things around so that if, if so that we have more jobs at those lower classification levels, um, that will create those first mm -hmm. and second rung on the ladder and really address that, that barrier to entry issue. Because once you've got your secret clearance and you've had that for a couple of years, um, then you're a much lower cost and lower risk for the expensive activity of getting the higher security clearance. And uh, unfortunately here in Escambia County still, because the primary cyber jobs are federal uh, in the classified environment, we have to address this. Yes, sir, we If do. we are gonna make the opportunities on Cori and NAS available mm -hmm. to the kids graduating from the high schools right around the corner from this places. So um, there's a lot of progress on that. Yes, you and I yes. haven't had a chance to talk about a whole lot and I was actually hoping to really spend some time chewing the fat on this at this event. So as yes, we sir, move to virtual, I'd really like to talk more about it. Yes, sir. We have a new director as in charge of the Office of Power Diversity for the state. Uh, Bruce, he attended the, the uh, Scammy County Minority Expo that Commissioner May, Commissioner Bender, and several people were there in person, and he's dynamic. He's definitely engaged with this. He's big into technology, and uh, I definitely would love to have him connect with you on a state level as well. Thank you very much, Chairman. I'm sorry for going on the nerd tangent there, but uh, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm really disappointed to hear that this is going uh, virtual. So uh, No more disappointed yeah. than me. I'm setting bet, up I the food truck, setting up the food, <laughs> setting up the meetings, the, even down to the tablecloths. Trust me, I, I did not want this to go 
per, uh, go virtual, but it may be no resort, depending on what yep, I've heard today. Thank you very much. Anything else, Commissioner Bender? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. All right. Uh, Joanne Peel. Good morning. My name is Joanne Peel, and I live on the west side of Pensacola. And um, great, Michelle, great job. Um, but I'm here about um, to publicly thank NAS uh, Captain Tim Kinsella and um, our uh, school board uh, superintendent, um, Dr. Tim Smith, and all the people involved in the Starbase program and bringing that back to life. And uh, I hear more and more about the utilization of the STEM program, which is science, technology, engineering, and math for our children. And I think it's very exciting for young children to have the opportunity to um, experience such things, considering you know our level of child uh, well-being is 47, and this is a way to move our children forward. And um, I uh, want to thank um, Miss Brianna um, McCrary for her work at Montclair with the STEM program, and Linda Brent, who brought the um, the Starbase program to the attention of um, Captain Kinsella. Um, this is important. Our children are important, as important as a tree. And I hope that you will require compliance out of the Children's Trust to do things like this for our children. Because you know, we had 13 years of a Scambia Community Collaborative now achieve a Scambia, a Scambia failed. And you have to stop making a difference. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. Sharon Clark. Good morning. Um, I need your help. Um, we are trying to close on a house, 800 West Mallory, that has a lien against it that um, was caught in the net of another property that th this owner has. Um, and he has sold that property, and the new owner has assumed the lien. And um, so he has no motivation of cleaning up that lien. So we have been waiting since June 24th to close on our home, and it keeps getting pushed back because nobody's doing anything about this property that needs environmental assistance. But um, the original owner incorporated, they put the lien on all the properties he owned. And so now we're the ones getting punished. He's free of the lien, his new person, has owned it since uh, August 2nd and has not done anything to clean up or, I mean, basically the property needs to be bulldozed in my opinion, but that's his property. But my property and my family is being punished for their ill-gotten um, lack of responsibility, basically. So I need your help to separate that property at 800 West Mallory. Sure. There, there, we do have a process and, and how Tim talk to you about oh. that so um not, not really anything we can do today okay um, usually there's um i mean you can it, it's usually falls under written communication and and uh, and, and we we try to address it i way. i think the realtor and our title company has gone through that um i know they filled something out and it was denied um but I just need some help. There's there's certain parameters that allow the the administrator to take, and then it, it comes to us. So um, if you get with Tim, he'll, okay. he'll walk you through that. 
The, Thank you. Yeah, the written communication process is a letter directly from you to the county attorney that then has to be put on our agenda. And okay. so it gets settled right here. So there's, if there was, if it was to be a denial, it'd be a denial as a result of a robust okay. discussion, which of course you okay. would deserve. But no. so I got to wait another two weeks. Um, whatever the, uh, whenever our next scheduled, yeah. next regularly scheduled meeting is. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you. So if you see Tammy's in the second pew right here. All right. Four. That's our final speaker. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Thank you. And for. All of my, my friends who were here to, for the heritage, you know, let me just say my record's been clear. I support saving the tree. I, I'm never away from that. Um, th this process, uh, rather we uh, support the land development code or rather we don't, uh, it's the language that's in there and, you know, and I'm not saying that it shouldn't be revisited. I, I certainly could uh, concur with that. But I believe that, um, citizens when you have this many citizens concerned they should understand the process and know what the process was uh, if I could retroactively go back I would I would probably have handled this situation differently if it was under my authority but I don't believe I should have responsibility without authority um, and with that being said Tim and Tim and Horace I want you to explain publicly what the process was um, because I, I certainly share those concerns but it certainly was not a vote from this dais uh, that's been in support. And Madam Attorney, I do understand that this is probably going in an appeal under litigation, so I've been advised to uh, not say very much, but I'm gonna publicly say to you uh, that I support the saving of that tree. All right. Yes, so good morning, Commissioner's Chairman. Um, the site was reviewed Per the language of the land development code, the plain language of the land development code as written, there was consultation with the environmental resource management department, and based upon the review of the language of the land development code, it met the it met the requirement for the development uh, order to be issued. So you said who reviewed it now, Horace? It was reviewed by the staff. What it, staff? It was reviewed by my staff. It was. Consult because of because of the the language of the LDC, we we consulted wholeheartedly and thoroughly with the environmental resource management department, um, and it was determined upon the plain language of the code that it met the requirement of the LDC. It Chips, did you did, did your department look at this? And I, and I know that you're an environmentalist as well. I mean, what what was the opinion? Commissioner, the Natural Resources Department uh, always has supported uh, the uh, Development Services Department. Whenever there are any questions or expertise needed about environmental issues, our staff does assist. But with and, that. And, and, and you know, not to put you on the spot, I, I'm more concerned specifically about this tree at this time, Chips. I mean, have we looked at this tree in this time because this is of of concern. So yes, sir. And so it's what I can do is just reflect on what our department role's been. Um, early on, on, just on this item, I don't care yes, what it's on, been in the past. On just on the tree itself. Um, early on in the process, uh, they asked our uh, Jimmy Jarrett, our arborist, to go visit the site, evaluate the tree, confer and confirm its size and its health, uh, which she did confirm that it was an 85-inch tree in good health. Um, later on in the process, uh, I, I, the owner or the, the engineer was working on a redesign. Um, I did review a set of plans that showed about a somewhere between a 15 and 20 percent reduction in building size uh, to try to accommodate the tree. When I did review it, um, it wasn't going to meet our minimum standard for tree preservation. And so I said that that redesign wasn't going to work. So I mean, so you said it, the design wasn't going to work. I'm mean, correct. So it's they they had a, a full design originally that had removal of the tree. So it's not possible for uh, the developer to to develop this around this tree, uh, in your professional opinion. It would be a, a very challenging. The the site itself is a half acre lot to do commercial on this lot. If it were say a different person other than a one, um, they would have to accommodate for the, the structure, their parking, and a stormwater pond. And that would be a very challenging thing to do on a half acre lot. 
and I, and I understand the challenges, but I mean, as one speaker, I think maybe what Melissa said, I mean, we have the ability uh, to do things from this dais. And so if it's stormwater, if it's uh, parking, I mean, do we have the ability to work to save this tree? I mean, I, it, it's, challenge, it's challenging for me to be here this morning. I mean, but so everything with government is challenging. So my challenge is let's figure out with the developer to all be good stewards and, and be good partners. Uh, there is a concern of uh, uh, the largest tree in the Scambia County. Uh, people have their constitutional rights for the acquisition of property to be able to develop it. But there has to be a, a happy medium somewhere in which we can resolve this without cutting down the tree because my position is to not yeah. cut down the tree. So I understand that it's a challenge. Yeah, I would does. hope that Horace, we could work within it to find that. Because although this tree is not coming before this board, something will come before this board at some point. We, we will, there, there is, the next avenue, according to the process of the Land Development Code, is for an appeal to be filed and to go before the Board of Adjustments. That is, that is the process. And once that, once that is determined, the, the BOA, they can, they, can, they can look at the facts and they can direct other venues to take, to, to take care. But the process is before to go before the BOA for an administrative appeal. I understand they have an administrative appeal. But once it goes to the BOA and administrative appeal, Allison, is, is there no jurisdiction uh, from the county? Once it goes to the BOA, it can be appealed to the circuit court. It would not come here. And after the circuit court, where does it go? And nothing. That's where it ends? It, it could be sent back down to staff to or to the BOA for reconsideration. It could be appealed to Tallahassee. Okay. Commissioner, um, what, one thing that, that I don't think was explored uh, is the uh, granting of variances to our land development code. Uh, so if, if the direction from the board would be for us to, to meet uh, with the property owner and the engineer and explore some of these potential variances that may allow uh, uh, development and preservation of the tree, we, we certainly can do that. And, and I can't speak for the board, Chip. I can only speak for me and, and, and my position of supporting this tree. But I would think that staff could bring back any recommendation, solution, and alternatives that you can find. And I mean, it will be up to a board to vote it up or down. Commissioner, I'd be in favor of, of trying to work through it that way. Well, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Well, is that a pretty good direction? Yes, sir. It's clear. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, thank you. Commissioner Andrew. Mr. Day, I have a question for you. Certainly not yes, our sir. first rodeo with regard to trees. Um, we, a number of years ago, uh, updated our tree ordinance through a, uh, a discussion um, with uh, uh, developer interests and environmental interests at the table. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Okay. And the, it was, was that the 2018 event or the 2016 event? Do you remember? It would have been more like 2016. That's what 2015, I was thinking. 2016. It may have even been 15. Yep. Um, and it was exact same issue, right? Um, uh, you know, certain little details were different, but it really came down to the same issue. How do we balance the collective value of the canopy versus the individual value of, of personal property rights. And how do we do that within the framework of the laws that ensure personal property rights? Kind of the same, at yes, the core, sir. the same thing of every, every other land development code or land use issue that we have. Um, we did, as a board, pass a 5-0 vote, um, a tree ordinance based on the discussion, if I'm not mistaken, you were actually the one that brokered that discussion among those inter interested bodies to bring a presentation to the board. Is that not right? I, I don't specifically recall. Seems, seems like it was you that was driving that, uh, that was really uh, not driving the boat, but keeping the notes, if you will. Um, and that became law in Escambia County, right, as a result of that? Yes, that is, sir. That is our tree ordinance? Okay. Outside of everything else that, that might have gone on, does this does taking down this tree for the purpose of this development meet that ordinance or not meet that ordinance? Yes, it does. It does? It, it, yes, as it's written, it does. Okay, and as it's written, is the terminology that was agreed upon by the environmental uh, advocates and by the development advocates not, you know, six years ago at the most, right? 
Yeah, it, yeah. As, as we made the sausage, this is what came out, and it's the law of the land today. So according to the ordinance as it's in place today, <laughs> this approval was, and, and the ordinance is in place today, again, was a negotiated and discussed upon thing by, and, and by the, and agreed upon by environmental interests and developer interests. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, the ordinance as it is today went through the planning board, was approved at the planning board, came to this board, and was approved by this board. Okay. Um, then it makes it fairly clear to me that from, from myself. Now, personally, would I like to see it be, you know, that people make decisions that are, are you know, better for the environment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but we cannot come back and revisit the ordinance every single time that something I mean, it's, it, you're at that point, where you're, you're, every time a new issue comes up and we're going to reissue or relook re at the ordinance again, um, then in fact you're negotiating in bad faith every time you sit down if you're just going to plan on moving the goalposts again the next time it comes up. Now, I'm no big fan of the LDC, and I think everybody knows that. The LDC as it currently is is a, is, is a paper tiger. This isn't that. This is an ordinance that was really written by the people. Uh, and put before this board and approved on a 5-0 vote. And it made a good balance. Uh, it particularly motivates people to, when you take down a large tree to replace it with many smaller trees. That's good for canopy health over time. Yeah. So while I hate to see the tree like that come down, um, we wrote this ordinance with the understanding, specifically talking about these heritage trees. So thank you very much. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. And certainly acknowledge my colleagues comment and obviously it was a 5-0 vote the reason you have case law and precedents every day because the law can be interpreted different by different judges and different lawyers and so saying that it's absolute and to put a staff member on the spot who's not an uh, attorney uh, is not right clearly uh, and to look at variances in which we do every day we, we look at alternative solutions in many instances for the betterment in the good of citizens and there's nothing wrong with doing that at this point because to be a good steward it will end up in court it will up in an appeal and the taxpayers will be paying a lot of money to attorneys and appeals so why not look at other solutions and we can't find them then it goes to court uh, and then the taxpayers still and we pay with some money so it's, it's not a response for you Tim sorry I'm saying you can sit down so I still stand uh, Mr. Chairman with asking staff uh, to look into that to try and find a solution thank you Mr. Chairman Um, that's it for the, uh, sorry, Mr. Bush, did you? Well, I, uh, <clears throat> I, obviously I got emails and everything like everyone else did. And my, my question to staff was essentially the same as Commissioner Underhill's, except I took it a different direction. And, m and my question was, could better policy, better well-written policy have helped staff? Because in, in some of these instances, you know, it, it comes down to, you know, it, it, one person could look at the exact same set of facts and take one, um, you know, uh, infer one outcome one way, and then uh, you know another person could look at it and say, "Well, that that doesn't meet the spirit of what's written," and that's that is a function of poorly written language, and sometimes language is intentionally uh, ambiguous to allow too much wiggle room. So, look, I, I, I would say I would say I, I completely support uh, uh, Commissioner May. It's his district. Um, I, I'll run into the same issue in my district. Look, there's no one up here that doesn't love a, a beautiful big tree that's a century or, or, or more older and, and we you know we want to find a way to, to keep that tree so but I, I do agree that there has to be a balance there has to be a balance and I think some of the mitigation stuff but staff got thrown into the middle of this and I you know what the one thing I don't support is is when you know folks are throwing out stuff like it's illegal um, because I was very very quick to ask that question of uh, Horace Jones Drew Homer and Tim Day, who all of whom I've spoken with at length about this topic. I've got the documentation and I've got our language as it's written. So um, it, I think the outcome here today, uh, the positive outcome is going to be that I think we're going to look at policy that's maybe a little more cut and dry when it comes to these really rare, magnificent big trees. But again, um, you know, that's our fault. That's on us. That's the language. And, and you know, uh, sometimes language has to be updated. And um, anyway, so that's where I'm at. So, Commissioner May, you know, you'll have my support. We bring something back that's reasonable. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, and we do appreciate those who are concerned. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I was going to ask a question. 
Well, we're going to break if, if you want to get with somebody or one of the staff members directly, but we're going to have a, a two-minute break so we can uh, keep going. All right, he said go ahead. Yep. All right. All right. Good morning. This is the August 19th uh, Board of County Commissioners meeting. Please turn your cell phone to the vibrate, silence, or off setting. The Board of County Commissioners allow any person to speak regarding an item on the agenda. The speaker is limited to three minutes unless otherwise determined by the chairman to allow sufficient time for all speakers. Uh, speakers shall refrain from abusive or preferring remarks, disruptive outbursts, protests, or other conduct which interferes with the orderly conduct of the meeting. Upon completion of the, board, of the public comment period, discussion is limited to the board members and questions raised by the board. Uh, I have the invocation uh, th today. We have uh, Rick Branch from the First United Methodist Church. Uh, I have the pleasure of, of serving with Rick on the Juvenile Justice Committee, and I appreciate all of his efforts that he's done for our youth, especially focused on uh, on trying to get them on the uh, civil citations. And I know it's also something that we're doing for looking at for adults as well. So, uh, Rick, thank you for being here this morning, and thank you for all you do for our community. And then, uh, Commissioner Underhill, can you lead us in the pledge? Thank you. This is a prayer um, from our United Methodist hymnal that is very important to me. It was written by Alan Payton, or Patton, who's the author of Cry the Beloved Country. Uh, he wrote this in the 1960s during a time uh, when he was working against the South African government, um, against apartheid, and um, it's a prayer for courage to do justice. So let us pray. O oh Lord, open our eyes that we may see the needs of others. Open our ears that we may hear their cries. Open our hearts so that they need not be without rescue. Let us not be afraid to defend the weak because of the anger of the strong, nor afraid to defend the poor because of the anger of the rich. Show us where love and hope and faith are needed and use us to bring them to those places. And so open our eyes and our ears that we may this coming day be able to do some work of peace for you. Amen. Please join me in the pledge to our flag. Rick, thank you so much for being here this morning. Appreciate it. Are there any items to be added to the agenda, Madam Attorney? No, sir. No. Commissioner May? No, no, sir. 
Mr. Underhill. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have one item to be added to the agenda discussion of uh, uh, Stefan's employment status with the county. Okay. Has that already been added? I believe, so, believe that was promulgated. Uh, Wes, that was promulgated, right? It's a uh, recommendation yes. concerning the chief budget officer. Yep, so that's already on the agenda. Okay, it made it on. Great. Yep, 3-4. Nothing for me, Mr. Okay, I don't have anything. Wes, anything else? Okay. Take Move to adopt the agenda. Set. Please vote. Motion passes 5-0 to adopt the budget. Commissioner's form, Commissioner. Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, very briefly, I want to thank uh, Michael Rhodes and Adam Reed and uh, the staff from Parks and Rec for, uh, for helping facilitate uh, a, a very sad and somber service yesterday. Um, there was a funeral held for Greg Gibson, uh, the young man um, from Northwest Escambia, uh, football program and uh, from the north end of the county that um, was laid to was laid to rest yesterday. The uh, service itself was on the football field at Bradbury Park, and uh, I know Mike and Adam did a lot of did a lot of work helping with uh, helping with chairs and set up. And I uh, also want to thank Wanda Mercer over at Compu Graphics uh, for turning around a, a sign, uh, a sign for the field, a large sign that was that was done in about two days, so that it could be erected before the service yesterday, so it would be there for the hundreds of people that attended the uh, that attended the outdoor service. Um, and uh, uh, I just want to thank Michael and Adam for, for their folks helping facilitate that. I know the family greatly appreciated it, and uh, uh, it was a you know beautiful service. And uh, the rain rain stayed away. It was hot, but um, uh, but fortunate with the weather to be able to complete everything. But thank you. Thank you, Commissioner May. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, knowing Coach Gibson, uh, Commissioner Barry knows in your district and it's tight knit and. Uh, Adam and Michael, but you know, some of their support staff, like Anthony Quillis and some of their other people, I, I, I know that were out, were out there and uh, were keeping me informed, and uh, they kind of felt it a, a privilege and an honor to be there to salute him. And uh, I know that we've all been hit hard by COVID in the Little League world, the Little League football, and uh, I know, again, in Molino, Coach Dunny Nicholson, who I've seen coach for many years, uh, in, in, in your district, um, and you know, those of us have coached the league for 30 plus years, we all tend to know each other. So, uh, absolutely, Don. I mean, Donnie coached thousands of young women uh, softball and, and coached dozens of uh, dozens of young women that went on to play at Tate and uh, uh, play at Tate and play in college, and uh, it had it had a huge impact in the Molino community. And and um, you know, I would suspect, um, you know, specifically related to softball in Molino that. There'd be something coming forward to recognize Donnie's contribution uh, to Don Sutton Park over over decades and decades of service. Um, you know, some some very tragic news earlier this week. That's absolutely right. Thank yeah. you. Well, whenever we would have a, a young lady that was going to excel in softball, we'd make sure that she get up, you know, on the north end to Donnie. And so, again, um, and I say this to all of our little league and all of our parks to be safe, to follow the CDC guidelines um, because uh, hospitalizations are up. Um, Although they have not been reported, there are many deaths. And when you see the death uh, of great leaders like Coach Gibson and, and Coach Nicholson, well beyond my district there, there in the north end, uh, it makes us pause and say that COVID is real uh, and uh, people are dying. And with that, I do want to thank Leroy Williams uh, and Claire Long over at Brownsville in partnering with Community Health, uh, Director Gilmore in the health department. Uh, for really uh, beefing up uh, the vaccinations and the testing uh, every day of the week. Uh, you can see hundreds and hundreds of people coming through Brownsville to get their, their test. And uh, we are seeing an increase in people who are receiving their vaccinations uh, due to the work of um, the health department and community health. So I do want to salute them. And finally, I do want to send my condolences and prayers to a, a, a dear friend of my family, uh, uh, a young man who played in my program on uh, Saturday, uh, again, to the senseless acts of violence. Uh, a young man graduated Washington High School, great football player, uh, lost his life, again, to the senseless violence that's occurring in our inner city. So um, 
Chief Randall uh, was on scene. Uh, Mayor Grover Robinson uh, spent Saturday uh, with me and and, and Sunday uh, uh, supporting. And we just want to give our prayers uh, to those families and and for the shooters of uh, Michael Yeld and, and for the shooters of the Don Clarity. If people have information, please report that information to law enforcement because we can't continue to have these senseless murders without uh, someone being held accountable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Underhill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just as we saw during the public forum, unfortunately, the, the politics of this county continues to be extremely toxic, uh, even at the family level. Uh, and uh, you know, when I came on this board, I remember that we were always very uh, careful about protecting our families from the consequences of our public service. And one of the things that we've done here on this board is to instruct the county attorney to always uh, communicate with us any public records request regarding our families. Um, Madam Attorney, it's come to my attention that David Bear is making public records requests for every uh, permit that's ever been pulled at my property since I moved in. Um, are there, and I, I, I'm really kind of disappointed, so it's odd that the most, ex most expensive employee that we have at the county seems to be working very uh, uh, directly for that individual, whereas uh, as a rich donor, but where the average person making public records requests don't get that same benefit. But I need to know, are there any other people who you are communicating with with regard to? Mr. Bear made a direct request of that information to me by email. I was told yesterday by Mr. Tolbert that he, Tim Tolbert, our building official, that he personally would reach out and tell you that that request had come into his inbox for, for processing. Based on that representation, I didn't feel that it was necessary for me to duplicate his effort. Okay, thank you very much for that information. Um, uh, not really quite the right decision, but I accept that that's why you made the decision. Um, is there anybody else uh, from any particular law firms in this county that are reaching out to you and asking these same inform asking information about my personal life? I don't run the, the public records No, I'm process. just talking about you personally, ma'am. Are they? That's the okay. only one, and it's only because the building official said he was calling you personally to tell you that I didn't feel it necessary for me to duplicate his effort. Okay, I understand. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all I have. Commissioner Bergosh. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to take a moment to um, thank the staff. You know, we had the Tropical Storm Fred that broke up into pieces, and for a long time there over the uh, end of last week and into the weekend, there, it looked like it was coming right here. And so um, over the weekend, um, the majority of our staff uh, assembled on their day off on Saturday at public safety and spent a good deal of time there. So um, I, I came by, I know that uh, Commissioner Bender was there as well. And I was just, um, I, I think it's very important to let citizens know that we have dedicated staff members. You know, they look at, at some of the things that we fight about and of course the press um, <laughs> they like to take shots at us, that's what they do. But meanwhile, um, those of us who are working, um, and that includes the staff, they spent their weekend keeping this community safe. And as it turns out, thankfully, obviously, we all know that storm didn't come our direction and it went further to the east. But I want citizens to know, and I want to take the opportunity to make it known that your staff, your employees of the county, um, your civil servants were, were there standing by a large group of them, more than 100, um, ensuring that this community was kept safe. And without that being said, that wouldn't make the news. Um, and I think it should make the news. I also want to take a moment of personal privilege to thank our office intern, Caleb White. A uh, young man came in, um, worked with Debbie Kenny, who always does a great job for me in my office, and just really took the bull by the horns. And the young man um, is heading back to Tampa to go to college. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb. Very, very impressive work, uh, a very professional young man. So we're, we're happy to have you. We're sorry to lose you. Hopefully you'll come back next year on your break. We'd love to have you back. Uh, maybe one day you'll come to work for the county. You're the kind of person that we need. And we have lots of openings, by the way. <laughs> uh, I hate to say that, but we do. Um, and, you know, so just keep it at all positive. I want to thank the staff for all their hard work over the weekend. I'm thankful the storm didn't come. The one behind it looks like it's going to Mexico. That's good uh, for us, bad for them. But. Um, I just think I would be remiss, uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if we didn't sometimes celebrate the hard work of our staff. Um, you know, we, uh, an illustration of this is uh, these decisions staff had to make about the tree. I mean, you know, they're trying to do their very best to follow the policies we've written out. And, you know, it's tough on them sometimes. You know, uh, they're, they're here to do a job. We're elected to handle the problems. So, um, I'm, you know, I'm happy to take on those problems uh, any day of the week because uh, our staff shouldn't have to be in the crosshairs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Jeff. 
just a response. I, I remember and Commissioner Berry was very supportive when I brought forth the intern program and a lot of people were skeptical about it and, and didn't want it. And it, I mean, we can look at each of our offices and these young people are learning government. And it was, to me, it's one of, the, one of those things that you're proud of. You know, we don't get a lot that we get to say, hey, I did that and you're proud of it. But to look in your office and see the intern and see the great things that they're doing, I know it's worked well in my office and Commissioner Underhill has one in his office. Commissioner Berry, I don't know about Commissioner Bender. But he, he's he, not quite young. But he's, he's not young, yeah. but he has one. But the intern program, has that is one of those programs where we are growing our own, we're training our own, and you know that's the next generation of leadership. So I'm I'm very grateful for the support that we've gotten on the intern program. So thank you for mentioning it. Thank you. Yeah, Jeff, and um, again, I, I think it's um, with some of those, it's it's tough to strike that work-life balance um, because we're constantly calling on them to step up, and you know, and and it's a hard job. It, it's it's it is our job, and, and they all they do. So it's. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it is a lot that, uh, and, and we've gone through a lot. I mean, it's been a, it's hasn't been the normal year and a half, two years for, for that they would normally <laughs> that they would normally see. And 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 you know what they've they've stepped up, and and so we appreciate um, all that they do for the organization. Um, so, um, and then I think we have a uh, presentation from Marie. And then also, I think we're going to uh, have be introduced to two new uh, CMR um, employees. So, um, Marie, if you want to come up, I saw your presentation was up earlier. If we can get that back up. Thank you, David. Good morning. Good morning, Marie. How you doing? Well, I'm doing okay. Thank you for asking. Um, just, you know, trying to kind of keep updating from, from previous weeks. Uh, again, just a reminder, the Florida Health COVID-19 website has the weekly report, as well as uh, portals to locate vaccine and testing in our community. Um, and that weekly report is updated on Fridays. Um, and then the CDC also has some data on their COVID data tracker website and the best way to find that is to put those words into your search engine it should take you right there um, continuing to see rises in cases um, week over week so um, you can see our um, weekly positivity and case reports on this graph here um, still showing in the 20 percent for positivity on a weekly basis Um, and again, the case rate, which is cases per 100,000 people in the population, continuing to go up as well. Um, something new that's happened since the last time I spoke to you is uh, StatLab Mobile has come into our community and set up a testing site. Um, and we're operating, or they're operating that, um, at the Brownsville Community Center on weekdays. And then they're going to be operating out of our parking lot at Fairfield on weekends. So that'll be seven to seven, seven days a week. Um, and that should be no cost to the consumer. So they will bill insurance for people that have it, but they have some type of funding stream that covers those that don't have insurance. And I think that's also alleviated a little bit of stress on community health um, because they were operating some testing as well, as, and we were operating testing at the Gregory Street location, which right now has been stood down. So. And I think I got a text or for the um, press release that Ascension has also started their drive-through testing again. Yes, I understand that Ascension is, is operating a drive-through testing at the site off of Bayou Boulevard that they previously operated at. And I believe that is five out of the seven days, uh, Wednesdays and Fridays, or four out of the seven days. I think, I think they're off Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday are the days they don't test. So... Um, uh, vaccinations, we're still working on getting people vaccinated. And again, I just would like to reinforce that that is a, a big key into um, ending, controlling, reducing um, transmission in our community. Uh, so we can see uh, cumulative people that have had at least one dose of vaccine as of the 12th is just over 130,000. Um, and then weekly, again, we're still seeing that uptick in vaccinations, which is very encouraging to me. So, um, 
and just, you know, just the CDC, what was that, Friday afternoon, um, put out information about a third dose for immune compromised people. So that is available for people who are moderately to severely immune compromised. Um, and there is some information that was just released yesterday, I believe, on um, booster doses uh, probably in about a month. So that's kind of where we are with those. So, sorry, so you're saying that uh, you'll be administering some of those if people wanted to in about a month? Uh, the, yes, the statement from the um, HHS and, and the CDC, I think, par targeted September 20th as a goal. Um, I don't have any action items on that yet, but that's what we're looking toward is, is a third dose in about, a, about September 20th, and that would be an eight-month post-second dose is the target they're looking at for those people. And we should get more information on that coming down in the next three or four weeks. Okay, so but and, and then that would be on all the providers that are, are currently administering vaccine, you could go to those, you can come to the health department, you can... Uh, right, anybody that's providing an mRNA vaccine, these are the third doses for Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Okay, and, and have they given any indication on if you wanna to try to stick with the same um, brand or uh, you can switch around or? Yeah, my current understanding is trying to stick with the same brand. I, th I think that if there's any changes in that, hopefully we'll be seeing that before the 20th as well. All right, perfect. Um, may I ask a question? Robert? Yeah, you, was, this, was this your conclusion or? Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm that's sorry. Just, you know, that's, that's, continue those prevention. That's, that's, I think that's yeah. the last slide usually, so yeah. Yep. Um, last time you were here, and I appreciate you coming and the updates. Obviously, I'm looking at the dashboard, and we're up again now to 390 people in the hospitals at 11 children. Um, but I was particularly interested in the um, the six percent, uh, the breakthrough people, like like which vaccines they took, what was their comorbidity. Um, did have, were you able to find any additional data on that six percent? Because folks like me that are vaccinated, you know, we're hearing anecdotally about um, folks fully vaccinated coming down with it, and just wanting to know if you had any insights on that. Yeah, really, really nothing. I did try to do as much research as, as I could possibly think of in terms of where to find that information. Um, and I think probably the best places you're gonna find that from is, is from the care providers themselves as to what they're seeing with acuity and, and who's, you know. But that 94% is, to me, very important number to continue oh, to share. It is the story. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the lion's share of the, of the hospitalizations, all of the deaths. I mean, that's, it's the people that are not vaccinated. But again, folks that are vaccinated get worried when they start hearing anecdotally, well, Scooby-Doo got, you know, COVID and he was vaccinated. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Well, and then we find out, well, there's 6% of them, but they don't tell you the rest of the story. And, and the rest of the story could be maybe these are 85 years old, hypertension, massively obese, you know, without the information, or did they get Johnson and Johnson, you know, or did they get, you know, so I, I it's somewhat frustrating because I can't, go hunt it down myself. But I, I, I do think if we can get a pie chart with robust data on the 6% who are in the hospital with COVID um, that have been fully vaccinated, I think that helps allay some concerns. And um, part two was last month when we spoke, I also asked if we could get some data on death locally. I, you know, you hate to be morbid, but um, we hear on one end from our um, medical examiner about the tremendous increase in cases um, but we're not getting any real good data. And we, I mean, we're hearing anecdotally about people we know, community, beloved community figures dying of COVID, but there's no uh, running total. Have we worked uh, to get that data so that we can add it to our dashboard? All right, yeah, I've, I've again been looking for that. I know Mr. Gilmore was looking for that. We've had conversations and I mean, it is hard to kind of get the real time validated data on that because there's kind of a trickle back effect. Um, that data should be reported through to the CDC. And again, I still haven't been able to lay eyes on that on their website and, and find out why that's not going through. It's and I wanted to publicly thank you for following up on our discussion last time. I had asked you for the study that talked about um, vaccinated people wearing masks, and, and, and you did send that to me. So I, I appreciated that. Um, I guess the final question is, as we talk about it, it's all over the news yesterday about the third dose for those of us who had two doses already. Is that because of these breakthrough cases, is that somehow related to the 6% of people getting it and at six months it wearing off or seven months? I, I'm hearing that it's eight months. Eight months after your second dose is when you now need to get the third shot. Is it because of that? Well, 
I mean, again, I think the best way to get the place to get that story is to go to the CDC website. They have some extensive statements on the, on the underlying rationale and, and the reasoning. But you're the health department director. So with all due respect, and I mean, I would, I would anticipate you'd be a wealth of knowledge on those hot button topics. You know, we're, we're dealing with trees. We're dealing with all kinds of other things. So, I, yeah, I understand that. Do you not know the answer? No. <laughs> um, I can I can try to sum it up for you. Did you send it to uh, me like last Let time? me look at it and, and sum it up for you. Thank you. And, and again, thank you for being here and your hard work. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Chairman, uh, Maria, th thank you for all the work and, and standing up at, at Brownsville and working with community health. A couple questions. I, you know, we're hearing, and I, I talked to some healthcare officials. I was actually at the hospital, unfortunately, with the shooting all weekend, and, and I know the beds are filling up. Uh, but with the recent outbreak in Alabama, do you think that that's going to have anything to do here with Florida? You think that that's going to spill over? Or I, I know we we keep hearing reports that you know next week it's going to be a big surge, or there's going to be a big surge after Labor Day. I mean, what are you hearing in the healthcare world, and what do you see, and and how do we prepare? Um, I would certainly prepare for for anything because we are geographically close to that community. Um, in, in the past, historically, you know, we have people that live here, work there, work there, live here. Um, so it's a, it's a line on a piece of paper. Right. Um, so and, I would, yeah, and that was for, for the reason I asked that question. I mean, because they said, you know, the next couple of weeks are probably going to be the worst weeks, but, you know, in Alabama. But as you said, so many people cross the line daily coming back and forth. So I was just wondering your insight. So, I mean, I would, I would certainly be concerned and be prepared and take the measures that we can take to prevent transmission. Okay. Mr. Chairman, with that being said, Eric, I mean, and Jeff, I, I'm too concerned, you know, and I talked to Mr. Faulkner over the weekend, uh, mostly related uh, to the shooting, but, you know, just getting those numbers, because as you said, you know, we had, I mean, probably two of, uh, you know, the most popular citizens in, in Commissioner Barry's district, uh, and I know many people are in, in my district and, and people that we work with, you know, but people are on the edge when they just don't know. I mean, we're having deaths within our own county. You know, and it bothers me um, that we've had deaths here in, in Escambia County employees as recently as, you know, last week. And I don't even know if we've even put any protocols in as a county, you know, uh, in, or made a special effort to at least educate uh, our, our, our employees, I mean, our employees are going out there at risk every day and they're dying. I mean, you can start back with Paulette Stallworth and come down. I mean, I can name four or five employees of Escambia County who've died because of COVID. And so, I mean, I don't think that inaction or no action is not an answer when you have a pandemic of people dying. And so, I, 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 I mean, is, is Mr. Gilmore here? I mean, uh, Maria, can you recommend any protocols, anything more we should be doing as a county to protect our employees? Um, really, again, I'm going to go back to vaccinate. So anybody we can encourage to take the vaccine, that's the best measure we have. Um, the more people we can get vaccinated and the faster we can get them vaccinated, the better it is for, you know, for reducing that transmission. That's going to be a big key. Well, and we're pushing it. I mean, I tell you, I mean, one thing I, I will say on our human services side with your partnership and Mr. Gilmore and our public safety, we have certainly been pushing vaccine. I know since March of 2020, I think I've, I've gone every day to some vaccination site to encourage people to do it. And we're moving, uh, Lumen, on today's dashboard, we're moving up. But, you know, I, sadly, I mean, if this data is correct, less than half of the population has, uh, has been vaccinated, not even with one shot. 48.3 have been partially only 39.1 have been fully vaccinated. So um, that's very really unfortunate. Those are those are low numbers, and um, you know I don't know. Well, I don't know because I mean some companies and some hospitals are moving forward with mandatory vaccinations and, and those type of things. At some point, I mean, they're going to have to be tough legislative decisions that we're going to have to make. I mean, because it quite frankly becomes very costly too. Uh, not only the employees dying, we have employees that are having to go home <laughs> and, and not being able to perform their work. May I interject one other quick, because that spurred another thought. If, if we, if this I've number- I've never done that before, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah. Um, uh, so the number of vaccinated folks locally, if that remains low, obviously, you know, we hear about this new variant, the Lambda variant. And the what? The Lambda variant. It's coming oh, from yeah. South America. Are you familiar with that? Um, and my understanding is it's much more lethal. 
Do we know anything? Is that in Florida yet? And is any of that in Escambia County? Are we measuring testing for the different variants? I, I haven't heard of any um, reports locally yet. Mm -hmm. um, some samples are sequenced for variants, but not all. So, okay. but um, isn't the isn't the concern that if enough folks are not vaccinated, that these different variants can, can and then eventually they come back on those of us who are vaccinated, and our vaccination isn't as effective? Is that isn't that the ongoing that, concern? That is one of the concerns yeah. in, in epidemiology. Well, and I mean, we can't, I, mean, I don't know if we can legislate people being vaccinated, but we certainly can mandate people wear masks in our building. And, and we can talk in our, about it. In, in, in our facilities. I mean, if people are not going to get vaccinated, we got employees who are dying, we got employees who are getting sick, and we're not taking every precautionary measure that we can, then I think at some point that responsibility is going to fall back um, on those who had the ability uh, to make that decision. And so, I mean, you know, I can't make you get a vaccination, but I certainly can tell you that you got to wear shoes and a shirt when you come inside my building and I can tell you that you need to wear a mask and not spread your germs or stay six feet apart I mean so uh, there is risk I mean there's enough data they won't tell us the deaths and that's unfortunately because that is a little political while we're not receiving all the deaths yeah. we ask for it I mean you know we bury them I mean here's my problem uh, when we have to send money over uh, to take care of more we give that money, we should be able to get the deaths and the causes of deaths. I mean, that, right, yeah, I, we don't need to know the names or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, we should know that information. Uh, and so, do, do you foresee uh, any mandatory masks coming down through the Department of Health at all? Uh, I haven't heard of anything. Yeah. Um, so, thank you. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Murray. Uh, Eric, how are we doing in our jail uh, on positives? I'm going to have to defer to. Chief. I mean, I, I mean, I want to, I want to update on so, the testing and the positives I, that we're having. In I the can jail. tell you, I've gotten him some testing cards, so I know he has testing are capabilities. We, are we testing? Oh, I, yeah, I suspect he's he keeps requesting them, so I'm sure he's he's burning through them pretty quick. So, how, how many tests are we averaging uh, a, a day or a week? I don't, I don't know daily or weekly. Should I give you the totals that we've done since we've begun this? Since I pulled this email back up data from this morning uh, are you saying since 2020 march of 2020 yes, or sir. it's just a continuous running number that they provide me how do we determine who get tested uh, by request it, or are we it's, testing it's by request or we see symptoms and and then we encourage the individual to take the test obviously we can't force any medical upon them just give me a moment please uh, since <laughs> the beginning of this we've tested 1800 and five inmates with 305 positive. We currently have six positive in our custody right now, which puts three of the dorms under quarantine. So we're managing six individuals inside. Are we able to quarantine those who are positive? Yes, sir. We take the ones that have been identified as positive, we put them in the infirmary, and any unit that they come off, we put them under an observation period. Nobody comes in or out until that period is gone. That way medical can observe them. Because we have our own testing machine in jail yes, through sir. community health. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. And we, we continue to provide shots for those that want it. We do it in increments of 20 once we identify 20 people that want it uh, because of, you know, we're concerned about spoilage of it. Each bottle um, provides about 10 shots. So once we get to a number of 20, we have them come in. <clears throat> Matter of fact, I believe they're, they're giving shots today to another 20. So it, it's cyclic. Uh, mm. We try and encourage everybody to take the shot as well. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks you. Eric, how many documented deaths from COVID do we have of employees since March of 2020? Of employees? Yeah. I, I don't have that number, sir. Um, I can get that number can you for get you. That number? I, I get that number for you, but I don't have that number. So right. that's cool. Uh, as far as the desk goes, I, I will let you know that we have state DEM calls, and all emergency managers across the state have asked for that very information. I'm not so, so we're pushing hard. It's just it's going to be up to the state to give it to us and DOH to actually roll that out. So, uh, but we are pushing, and uh, it, until they give us that information, we we don't own it. So absolutely. Anyway, all right. Um, no, I no, Eric, I know you're no, doing a good job. Hard, I know the hospitals ask us for a lot of support. We give a lot yes. of support. In, and and mean, they've been it, great it, giving us the numbers and everything, which helps us update our dashboard. So they, right. the hospitals have been a great partner. Right. So and, and I, I agree with Commissioner Bagash in his request. And so hopefully we keep. At we're least, still pushing. Yeah, we'll we're, push. I mean, we'll just ask the question every board meeting until yes, sir. we get the answer. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Chairman. Thank you. All right. Mr. Mara? Chairman. Yes, sir. Sure. Go ahead. Thank you. Hey, Director. I mean, it's. I understand that that's the that we're we're getting the silent treatment on the mortality rate. Um, yes, sir. 
I would uh, recommend that you explain in those meetings that they are creating a trust vacuum with the oh, people. Oh, no, it's been discussed, believe because me. Because a year ago when we've been through this already and the yeah. death counts were, I mean, literally running across our, our TVs at all times. Right. Um, the idea that somehow today, a year later, we can't do it even at the level that we did it before. Yes, sir. Um, strains credibility and, and really requires a little bit of a, uh, I mean, it requires that you hit the I believe button in, in spite of everything in front of you. Um, there's nothing to be afraid of with these facts. That's right. Now, if it doesn't necessarily, uh, uh, you know, and, and we keep, we're being hearing this a lot, well, if we put that information out, then citizens may make decisions that are detrimental to them. That's not how government works. And you are actually, we are, we as a government are causing more people to uh, be resistant to good business practices because of that trust gulf. And this is exactly one of the things, the kind of thing that creates that uh, uh, trust gulf between the citizens and their government that creates the kind of pushback that we see with regard to people engaging in the best business practices to keep their families safe. So I do hope that you are articulating that message at length uh, and as vociferously as you can, um, because uh, when a government loses the trust of its citizens, uh, we become even more ineffective than we are today. Yes, sir. And it's not only a scam of county, it's a lot of counties across the state that have echoed exactly what we're trying to push. So it's, it's not just one county, it is across the state that we're asking this. And we've all expressed that. Eric, is there anything that we can do more as a board? Uh, I, and I'm sure it's not the appetite that I would have for masks and all those other things. But are there are there things that you can recommend that we should well, be doing? So you know, you know, public safety. We're we're out there in it, uh, my guys and uh, the ladies that uh, represent public safety. We're doing masks because that's that's the best thing we could do. Absolutely. Uh, of course, we're encouraging employees to get the vaccine. And uh, I will tell you, I have seen an uptake on the vaccine uh, because of the situation going on and a lot of people losing our close friends. And, and the age range we're seeing is, it's all over the place. It's not just a demographic in the high, you know, 65 and above. Uh, so I have seen a small uptake in public safety and throughout the community and people who I thought never would get the vaccine have gone out and gotten it because something got their attention. So, and unfortunate, it takes somebody close to you dying or somebody like that for them to do that, so. Yeah. A funeral uh, gets your attention. A funeral gets your attention. Um, you know, uh, Greg Gibson just recently had a lot of people who was affected with um, impacted by that oh, and yeah. made a made a made a decision change so uh, but no sir this uh, we're doing what we can uh, we have sanitation we've got PPE we've got all that out for our employees and, and it, of course ask them to use it but uh, but the vaccine is going to be the, the kind of thing that's going to help us out get to the end of this so thanks Eric thank you all right thank you Laura you want to Thank you for this opportunity. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Laura Cole, the communications director. I know you all know me, but for the public, I am so excited to announce uh, there's actually three new staff that's going to be helping communicate um, to the public and to the media uh, all of our great information that we're doing at, at the county. And so you'll see a news release coming out later today with more details about these folks. But I'd like to first introduce Davis Wood. You may uh, recognize his voice later as uh, Davis Allen from News Radio um, 92.3 and um, 1620. That's right. And uh, all three of these new employees are graduates of the University of West Florida. And next, we have Andy Gibson. And she's going to be our media and public information manager. So she's going to be cranking out those news releases and social media uh, and uh, answering uh, also some media inquiries as well. And then at the library, we have Sarah Stanford. Unfortunately, she can't be with us today. Um, but she is a multimedia communication specialist. Welcome Perfect. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good to see you, Davis. Good to see you guys again. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Wes, you have anything else? No, sir. Okay. Take a motion on the proclamations. Move the proclamations as presented. Second. Please vote. Uh, 
Hey, Stephen, I don't think it's. Sorry, Commissioner Bender. I meant uh, it was a 5 to 0 vote. It's oh, not showing up because sorry. of the okay. proclamation here. All right. Motion passes 5 0. Um, all right. Who's doing the. Sean, there's Amber. Okay, perfect. Good morning. morning. Thank you for the opportunity to present to Sean. Um, so my name is Amber McClure, for those that don't know me. Um, this is Sean Hunter. I will tell you, Sean has been my glue this past year. I've had the, the pleasure to get to work with her. Um, and she has taught me many, many things that I didn't know I didn't know. <laughs> um, Sean is one of the most loving, caring, giving, and selfless people that I've ever met, and it is my honor, the day before my last day, to get to present this to her um, and, and recognize her for everything that she gives, not just to the people inside of Escambia County, I can't look at her, <laughs> but also to the community. <laughs> um, so here we go. Whereas Escambia County has established an Employee of the Month program to recognize one employee to represent the various departments, and whereas Sean Hunter, a director's aide in the Management and Budget Office, began her employment with the county in April of 2014 and is selected as Employee of the Month for August of 2021 for the standards of excellence that she has displayed in the performance of her duties and Whereas Sean Hunter began her career with the county in 2014 as an administrative assistant in the county attorney's office, where her duties consisted of preparing and filing animal cruelty cases, assisting with the code enforcement related issues, providing assistance with merit system protection board claims, preparing ordinances and resolutions as it related to county policy, and maintaining the workload of two assistant county attorneys that was a mouthful, you did a lot. And whereas in September of 2019, Sean joined the Management and Budget Office as Director's Aide, her duties consist of managing the operations of the Office of Management and Budget and the Community Partners Program. In July of 2021, Sean received her bachelor's degree in business administration and was promoted to budget analyst, where her scope of work has been expanded to support four departments as their budget representative. Recently, the successful and timely launch of the OpenGov budgeting and reporting software program was dependent upon Sean's commitment for supporting her coworkers. She has been vital in the setup of the backbone structure of the system, in mapping the chart of accounts, managing communications countywide for the budget workshop, and supporting the Office of Management and Budget through the release of its first annual interactive online budget book. And whereas Sean especially shines in her community partner and discretion, discretionary funds work, not only assisting the partners through the application process and management of the program, but she takes time to develop a personal relationship with each. And I know there are several, there were a few in the, in the, the audience that could have spoke to this as well. Um, she has been known to show up at events including awards banquets and youth sporting events hosted by the community partners and discretionary recipients. She is the epitome of a team player and exemplifies excellent customer service through support of the county departments and community partners. If a catastrophic event such as a hurricane should strike Escambia County, she is the first one in our office volunteering to assist at the Citizens Information Center because as she says, it's my way of giving back to the community. And she did that just this past weekend, again, <laughs> again. And whereas when Sean is not at work, she enjoys using her culinary degree skills, I have a kitchen, <laughs> to entertain friends and family, supporting local nonprofits and sponsoring four children in the Philippines. Most importantly, and that's who's behind her, she enjoys spending time with her husband, Mike, children Blake, Rachel, Carrie, and Chris, and especially her grandson, Hudson. We're missing three of those folks, but that's okay. We got the other three. <laughs> now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Escambia County, Florida, commends and congratulates Sean Hunter on her selection as Employee of the Month for August of 2021. Thank you.
You want to take one? Just your hand. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. I appreciate this recognition. I would like to say that in the beginning, when I started with the county, I have been under great um, management with the county attorney's office, um, clerk of court, uh, budget, and I just look forward to many years of continuing to serve our community. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. We look forward to that. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, as Commissioner McGaugh shared earlier, um, we have many employees that go beyond the call of duty, and I tell you, Sean Hunter, in my opinion, is one of those great employees. I don't care if we're giving away book bags or, as they said, if we're it's at a ball field or, or agencies, uh, she not only sits there and does it administrative, but her and her, she drags her husband out. Uh, and I, I want to publicly say, I mean, anytime we've needed her on the west side at Brownsville, anything that we do, Sean is always there showing passion and compassion. And, I mean, you are... A, the best, Sean, and I appreciate all that you do outside of what you get paid to do. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Todd. Good morning, commissioners. I'd um, like to proudly introduce the uh, Kiwanis Club that is here, and they've made a contribution uh, to help the citizens of the county, especially the children. As you may know, the, their current motto is, you know, serving the children of the world. And the best way you can do that is to expand their horizon by helping them learn to read. Uh, the focus of their grant will be to buy additional children's materials to help all the citizens of the county. And I'm going to have uh, our new head of the children's department for all county locations, Miss Stevie Thomas, read the proclamation. <clears throat> So I'm Stevie Thomas, and I'm the Youth Services Coordinator for the West Florida Public Library System. And I'm going to read this to honor our friends with the Kiwanis Club of Big Lagoon. Whereas the West Florida Public Libraries is an organization committed to supporting early literacy initiatives, and whereas the Kiwanis Club of Big Lagoon is committed to supporting the community of Escambia County, Florida, and whereas the Kiwanis Club of Big Lagoon are volunteers changing the world through service to children and communities, and whereas the Kiwanis Club of Big Lagoon helps shelter the homeless, feed the hungry, mentor the disadvantaged, and care for the sick, and whereas the Kiwanis Club of Big Lagoon has made a donation of $4,000 to the West Florida Public Libraries in the hopes of improving our community one child at a time, whereas the Kiwanis Club of Big Lagoon supports, sorry, works to give children a chance to learn, experience, dream, and succeed in great things. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Escambia County, Florida, recognizes and appreciates the Kiwanis Club of Big Lagoon's donation of $4,000 to the West Florida Public Libraries to support early learning initiatives. We also have Chris Hare, the branch manager for Southwest. It's through his efforts and Kiwanis and Stevie's that we'll make sure this gets utilized as best as possible. Yes. Sorry, we do have one more thing. I, I wish uh, oh. the check could be this many times bigger as well. Uh, <laughs> okay. But we appreciate everything and uh, just acknowledging we have received the funds, which we will immediately put to use. <clears throat> If the gentleman would like to say anything, we one thank you so much for your generous support and donation to the to the children to the library. Uh, I know that uh, I've I've met a couple people just over the last few weeks that that love going into our libraries and 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 finding books and movies and, and everything else. So we appreciate this donation. But please, if you'd like to say a few words, thank you. It's a it's a pleasure to serve. Uh, the children of Escambia County. This is a small part of what Big Lagoon Kiwanis does. We also donate 10,000 books 
every year to six different elementary schools and 100 accelerated readers to 14 different elementary schools in our program of Readers Make Leaders. So, uh, but it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure to help out and serve in this community. Thank you. Thank you. All right, board, and I'll be presenting the other uh, proclamation later this week. Uh, written communication. Um, I believe the first one is the one that we saw uh, last time, and I see Brian's here. Um, Brian, I didn't have you sign up, but I figured you'd probably want to speak or something. So if, if we can just make sure that we uh, get you to sign up okay. before you leave. So, um, Madam Attorney. Oh, boy. Do you want me to go through all of this again? This is the one with the multiple LLCs. Right, this is the multiple LLCs, and I think, uh, I can't see this. He, he's yeah. out of the room. Okay. I, the, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, just as a reminder, this is the one where there are two properties at issue. One is on Davis Highway, one is on Beverly Parkway. Uh, one is in District 4, one is in District 3. And back in 2006, the special magistrate found the property on Davis Highway to be in violation. There were several violations, and the county ended up having to abate it. That property later had a foreclosure on it, and the company that ended up owning it after the foreclosure is ALT Properties, LLC. Separate and apart from that, in 2007, a company called NMT LLC acquired title to property on Beverly Parkway. There's not really any specific tie between the two properties that's obvious other than there's one principle in common between the two LLCs. Um, and then I think what it doesn't appear to be obvious that the foreclosure extinguished or didn't extinguish the county's lien during the foreclosure process. So in order for them uh, to be able to convey title with totally clean title work. They are asking for relief, and that's why Mr. Hoffman appeared at the last board meeting, and there was an ask from the board for a couple extra weeks to allow for some more uh, review of the facts. And I can try to answer any questions, or I'm sure Mr. Hoffman can also try. I can't. Would you like me to make comments on it now? Um, sure. I, I think the issue that Commissioner May raised at the last when we left off was precedent. Are we establishing a bad precedent? Because right now the request is to basically release the cloud of $75,000 lien. I think right out of the block it needs to be clear. That is not asking for relief for any hard money. There's substantial questions on enforceability as to that lien, um, as noted by the county commissioner that had been, uh, excuse me, by the county attorney. You're not gonna be able to foreclose it out. So from that standpoint, I don't think you've got any precedent issue. I think what you do have, though, is a question of fairness. What's fair to the county and what's fair to the citizens? And the reality is the current owners of the property never had notice of this violation. They bought it. They only became aware of it after the fact. It basically dealt with garbage and tree services being removed. And what they've come to the county with now is, you know what, even though we didn't know, we want to pay whatever those hard costs are, which amount to about $4,300. If the property owner didn't pay that, to be candid, the county's never going to get it. This has been sitting there for 10 years. But as to the 75,000, to release that. And that essentially amounts to what was a $500 per day penalty. Even if you were gonna debate the penalty, the amount is quite substantial and severe relative to most um, special magistrate opinions. But again, the property owner right now wasn't there when that went through. They never got constructive notice. So I think it's fair to the citizen. It's definitely fair to the, the, to the property owner who's been contributing, running a, a business that has been in compliance for the last 10 years. But it's also fair to the county and fair to the county's coffers by returning the approximate $4,300 of cost that was incurred about 10 years ago when trees and other debris were removed from the property. So with that, I would request that uh, the... Um, the, the lien relief be granted with the only caveat being that our formal request, I think was about $3,800. 
as what we were willing to pay. At the last meeting, the, um, the gentleman clarified that the calculation on the county's end was approximately 4,300. We are agreeable to paying that amount, which would amount to hard cost. That's the 1,100 for court costs. This predates the county's reduction of the court costs. And then the abatement was 3,206. There were 75,000 dollars worth of fines that did accumulate back in 2006. Commissioner Underhill. Thank you very much. One question for the speaker. Is the property currently in compliance with all of our ordinances and laws? It is, and they confirmed that by county staff at the last, last okay. meeting. Um, Mr. Day, as of today or, or the most recent time that you've looked at it, they are in complete compliance. So you all can't hear it, but he's uh, giving a thumbs up and a heads up and down. So um, thank you. I'm understanding from staff that the property is in complete compliance at this time. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, Brian, thank you for coming back and thank you for your due diligence. Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't have a problem with the 43 uh, because this property is um, in compliance and on our tax rolls. And uh, I think that uh, the owners are, 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 are respectful business people that are going to do good work. So I, I don't have a problem with uh, waiving the daily fines. I just want to make sure we we're not setting the precedent. So. Brian, thank, you've, thank done, you, you've done a great job. Thank you. Thank Next you. motion. And I'd, I'd agree, so, yeah. Second. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. So thank the, you. Uh, uh, Madam Attorney, does there need to be any specific language to that? Is it separating out from? I, I think that they wanted relief specific for both properties. Isn't that what the ask was, Mr. Hoffman? That is correct. There's only really one property, the 7822 Davis. It was ever a compliance issue. But based on the related nature of the principles, it's creating a fuzz of, on title for 436 Beverly Parkway. That property was never at issue on any compliance. Okay. So we're asking it to be cleaned up for both. So, okay. so, so I would say your motion needs to be reflective that in exchange for payment of hard costs of 4306 um, plus any clerk or administrative fees, that these that this lien is waived with regards to or released with regards to both 7822 North Davis and 436 Beverly Parkway. Commissioner, is that the motion you intended? Second stance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any further discussion? Please vote. Motion passes 5 0. So thank you very much. Uh, and then, Brian, if you can just sign up on your way out. Thank you. Um, okay, our next written communication we do have a speaker, Jennifer Suarez. Hi. Hello. Uh, um, yeah, just go ahead and. Me? You, you can just go ahead and, okay. and say um, your name for the record. And I represent uh, a client. He sells property and couldn't because we discovered a previous owner had a lien attached for Sun County had in the pro uh, property as in the county. Um, we are asking for a partial release so that he can have a clear title and sell that property. And I, and I want to point this out. I don't know if it's the right time. Um, I've discovered that last September, the person who has the lien against him sold property and the lien was never attached to that property. I think it was a missed opportunity. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if yes, you don't sir. mind, are you, are you referring to Greg English? Yes. Yes. Huh, okay. That is, that is uh, concerning. Yes, it is. Big. Yeah. Madam Attorney, do you have anything else? Do you, mind, do you mind providing to the county that information, whatever you said you found? Was it an LLC's name or? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Do you mind providing that, what information you found about that to the sure. county so that we can just kind of look into that? Sure, who do I give that to? Um, yeah, we so you know, whoever, so somebody's gonna, somebody will walk up there, just give it to them. Okay. Thank in, you. In the, in the backup with this specific property, uh, Greg, it says that Greg, Greg English purchased it in 01 Mm -hmm. And it was sold to Eric Rivera in May of 2014. Yes. In January of 2015, an order against Greg English attached to the property. Mm -hmm. And it was not until four months later was the deed Filed. from the sale of May 14 recorded 
And we, I'm not saying we don't, no know, we don't why. know why. Yeah. And then in August of 2018, Eric Rivera transferred property to mm -hmm. Daniel Rivera, who is his yes. father. Yes. And so you are representing the Riveras? Uh, not Eric, <clears throat> just Daniel. Just Daniel. Yes. Uh, also, Mr. Chairman, in December of 2019, in exchange for $3,050, this board did grant partial lien relief to Greg English regarding this particular lien and its attachment to 480 Jacoby Road. The lien did remain attached to all the other relevant properties, including the 3010 Marcus Street. Well, why didn't we collect these hard costs then? If these are hard costs, why wouldn't they have been on that? Why wouldn't they have come up in that, in that item? I, I don't know, I'd have to look. And so, and Robert, I. I was talking about her statement saying that we allowed another right. transaction very recently for him, not, not the older transaction, but okay. in 2020. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll have to look at this. And um, it's, con I mean, it's concerning if we're, you know, when we're providing partial lien relief for somebody but collecting the hard costs, which we are doing, collect we are collecting the hard costs. It's concerning that we're not collecting all the hard costs, apparently, if, uh, if we had a transaction go pr through pretty recently that that allowed this to remain because it wasn't attached it should be attached to everything mm -hmm. ideally right isn't that the way this works you're, you're you, what it depends on what you do but a lot of times what you're doing is you're doing a partial release which means one specific property gets freed from the obligation but it still remains in yeah but what but the obligation isn't the obligation broad to all the properties like wouldn't, you know, John Doe, if, if there's a lien related to John Doe, those, if there's multiple liens related to John Doe, all those liens should be attached to all the John Doe properties. And if we, you know, there, so I would expect we would have certain cases with multiple viola with, with violators that have had multiple violations that we would have, maybe we would be granting multiple partial releases, but collecting all the hard costs. That's what, uh, that's what I'm getting at. But if we, if we allowed, you know, a release of, by collecting the hard costs of another property, this lien itself should have been on that other property too, right? I would think, but we'll have to take a look. I don't know what. And um, so my question would be is if the one that we partially released, was that the one that got sold recently? No. No, that's not. The partial release was a property on Pensacola Beach in 19, and this one was in Cantonment and just sold last September. Well, is or less. on Klondike. You're talking about Klondike? Mm -hmm. Not quite can't time it, but okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Close. Thank you. Close. All right. So do you want to uh, push this to the next yeah. meeting? I, I, I mean, I don't. It seems to highlight an internal issue sure. that, you know, I would hope that we could remedy. I don't know that it's these folks for halt. Um, you know, I, I, I would hope that, you know, maybe we could have somebody take a second look at, you know, existing code enforcement liens. Let's make sure that they're attached, that they're attached to everything that people own. And if you have one violator that has multiple liens, all those liens should be attached to all the properties so that if we need to do, if we're going to do a partial lien release for somebody, then we may have that opportunity to, uh, to go ahead and extinguish multiple uh, multiple existing liens by collecting all those hard costs at one time. And what it sounds like we did here was we collected one hard cost, released a property, the same individual had other liens that have hard costs associated with them that for whatever reason weren't attached to that property at that time. And maybe that's something that, 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 we, can, that, that we can address internally. No, I don't see it as their issue. I, I, sure. I don't have an issue moving forward with it. It's not, the, this property is not in my district necessarily, but I don't have an issue with this. And, and I would I agree know. with, uh, with where you're going on making sure that they attach to all properties, all liens attached to all properties? It's the only way we're going to collect them. I mean, it, it's, you know, yes. we're already doing such a, in my opinion, we're already doing such a, such fair treatment by only collecting the hard costs. And, uh, you know, that's not always been the practice of the board. It's been the practice of the board for, you know, eight years or so, but it hasn't historically always been the practice of the board. I feel like we're being very, very fair in that regard. And if I'm being fair, I want to make sure that I'm being fair to, you know, to the public that we represent as well, which is collect these hard costs that are not, that should be in the county coffers already, and they're not. 
And that's our opportunity to collect them when transactions are trying to go through. Sure. He has 16 other properties in his personal name. So my thought is like, I would, I would like the 3010 Marquez to be released because there is plenty of opportunities to collect on other properties. Yes, ma'am, your stuff's looking okay. So I, I would, yeah. you're, you're, I think you're okay, but we're Commissioner talking Underhill? about some others. Okay. Um, I would certainly agree with the statement uh, that uh, Commissioner Barry just made. Uh, you know, the next money that is made off of the sale of this man's property should be the people of Escambia County. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and let me rephrase that, the next debtor that should be paid uh, are the people of Escambia County uh, to whom he owes a great debt because we've done work on his property that he refused to do himself. Um, so, um, you know, I would be, uh, you know, we, we already did, we've, we've already done this once, right? Mm -hmm. um, and now, and what's gonna end up happening is if we continue this practice, we're gonna get down, um, you know, can I, can I pay you tomorrow for a hamburger today? Mm -hmm. um, you know, one is, one is already one too many. Um, I have to hold my nose and vote uh, when we do that because mm -hmm. that is the practice of this board. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, uh, Commissioner Barry made a very good point is that this is a debt to the people. Mm -hmm. uh, the people were harmed by his behavior uh, in the form of lower quality of life and quality of place for the citizens around um, these, these properties. So um, I won't be, you know, the, the, he, he, the, we've, already, we've already given one opportunity to start to get in the get right club. Mm -hmm. um, the next sale of property needs to extinguish all of the liens mm -hmm. that are, um, the, the hard costs for the liens. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that's as, as Commissioner Barry just says, more than generous. Um, mm -hmm. You know, get them all cleaned up, and then you don't have to keep coming back to us every time you want to sell something. Okay. That's that's the right solution, and uh, and that's the only thing that I'll be supporting on this matter going forward. Thank you. Is there a motion? I move to collect the hard costs and uh, and grant the relief that's requested. I'll second that. And that's for the hard costs associated only with this property, or does that clear all of them, uh, all hard costs for all of his liens? No, just associated with this property. Okay. Okay, please vote. You're done. Thank you. Motion passed 4 1 Commissioner Underhill in dissent. Did the clerk's office receive the proofs of publication? Move that we waive the reading. Yep, and we did receive them, okay? Yes, sir, we've received all proof. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. second. All right, please vote. Motion passes 5-0. Madam Clerk. Thank you. I have two si items on the consent agenda. The first is a recommendation concerning the TDT collections in June that we receive in July. Also, to give you the July's number that is not in this report, it's 2.9 million. So you can put that in perspective as to prior collections and with the collection of the fifth cent. It's, um, it's outpacing prior years. It's doing quite well. Second item is recommendation concerning minutes and reports prepared by the clerk to the board's office. Okay. I would also like to make a couple comments on ICMA uh, topic. The first, I think what I'd like to tell you is I've read the two opinions from your office and your direction and my position has not changed. The second issue that I'm looking at is I still believe that the ICMA contribution plan for elected officials is outside general law. I cannot find any language that is permissive of it. I will conclude my research. I will provide formal writing. Those of you that are in the plan, I will give you plenty of time to decide what you want to do as a county or as an individual when the contributions cease. That's my stance, and I thought I would let you know publicly. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Madam Clerk, well, <clears throat> since we're on your portion of the report, um, there's been a lot of talk about some expenditures out of the sheriff's office, and there's been some insinuations that uh, the, somehow the county is involved in this. Um, obviously, I want to make that statement that I, none of us, so far as I know, had any knowledge about the purchase of a statue. But, um, yes, did the clerk's office approve that? I mean, who approved that expenditure and what was the mechanism for that? 
because I certainly wouldn't have approved it. I don't govern the sheriff's office. Okay. I cannot even audit the sheriff's office. You cannot even audit. So no. that would have just been done unilaterally with no one having any knowledge of it. That is I know correct. I certainly did. The law provides him to be a standalone constitutional. There are some reimbursement funds that I can tap. This is not one of them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Move the clerk's report. Second. Please vote. Motion passes 5-0. Um, and just for my part, I mean, Madam Clerk, it's something that you've paid for two and a half years for me. Um, so I would hope that you have a a ruling that states your position um, because in our discussions with FRS um, they don't seem to support those so in your ruling with FRS in, in our I said in our discussions with FRS I have not seen any it, I mean just phone conversations that we've had with them they have not mm -hmm. necessarily agreed with your with assessment, what part with your assessment that with illegal, what part of the assessment that the you're saying that they're the illegal rate. what part is illegal you're saying that our plan is illegal. Is that right? I'm not using the terms illegal. I, I mean, believe you that's before. something you. I mean, I mean, you did before. Let, let's go ahead and define that, Commissioner Barry. I have always said it's outside general law. It is your commissioner that wanted it to be said illegal. Whenever you use the term illegal, that implies criminal connotations. So let me give you an idea. Well, that, that's if why I was surprised when you used it, because no, you did use that word. Yes, you, did. you did use that word. You and Cody both did. We can roll the tape back. And yes, sir. As I've said many a times, when it's outside general law, for instance, open container, you're in Savannah, you have an open container, a police officer tells you, dump it out, we have an open container law, go back into the establishment. You've got a choice. You're outside general law. If you make the choice to continue to drink it, walk, you're probably gonna end up in handcuffs. It becomes illegal. It becomes criminal connotation. In this situation, I have always stated that it's outside general law. I've put it in writing that it's outside general law. Burgos demanded that we state that it was illegal. In my opinion, when you consider, when you continue outside general law, it does become illegal. We are avoiding illegal by getting it within general law. So what I would like is your IRS opinion, a written documentation of your conversation. I'm not having those conversations, nor did I get that as feedback. With, with all due respect, and I don't take this plan, mm -hmm. but I just find this to be highly unusual We've, we've provided you with two well-written, very eloquently, well-cited, backed with statute opinions. Our own county attorney states the contract is legal. I just don't understand if, why you would hesitate to say it's illegal. If, if, you, if you don't feel it's illegal, you need to pay. Let us solve the problem about the amount. That's our problem to solve. Do you have an explanation? Can you answer that? Yes, I'll put it in writing within 30 days. If it's Put it out, in writing. If we're, it, having a, we're having a discussion. If it's outside general law as a viable retirement option, then it cannot continue to go forward. Do you understand that we're watching you constructively void a contract that this board authorized in 2016? Yes, before, sir, I do. before I was on the board, no, please let me finish. Before I was on this board, this, this board voted to authorize that contract. And by your, the action that you're taking, you're essentially constructively voiding a contract that this board authorized. I just don't think it's appropriate. What's gonna happen next? My fear is this is a precedent. Maybe you don't like the amount we're paying for consulting. Maybe you don't like something else we decide to spend. It's, it's, it's inappropriate. It's a problem. I don't take this, this plan, but I don't like what I see, and I will step up and zealously guard our powers as a board to contract, because we're the entity that contracts. Now, you're, you're saying, well, I can't say it's illegal, but this, unless it is illegal, I think you have a duty and an authorization to pay the charge. And if not, I guess, you know, again, I'll, we'll see what my counterparts want to do, but I don't, I don't think it's a good precedent for us to set up here on this dais. Thank you. 
I don't think it's good precedent to have 58% of your salary go into a defined contribution plan. Separate issue. Plan. Separate issue. It is all the same issue. No, it's not. No, it's not. But, but Madam opinion, Clark, what, when I asked that question, that was how your office defined it. I mean, when I asked that question, I said HR had said that I was going to get get X, and your office said, no, we read it that you get 2X. I mean, am I correct on that? I mean, that was, that was when I contacted payroll, they said, no, HR is missed. We read it that you're getting 2X. I was not part of that conversation, but I'm going to go ahead and stipulate that that's what happened. There is a long time precedent of HR getting the rates from FRS, giving them to OMB, forwarding them to payroll. It, statutes changed about 20, no, about 1999, again in 2007, which is where and why FSU, or FSU, uh, FRS changed the form. Okay, as far as the rate, that's just how it has always been done. At the point in time it comes to somebody's attention that it shouldn't be done that way anymore, that's when you have to take action. So I'll take the blame in whatever time frame that you're talking about for you. I'll take that. Maybe I should have known, maybe I didn't know, but that's not what we're, where we're at and what we're talking about. We're talking about today and going forward. Well, Pam, let me ask you something. So we're giving 27% to our high-end employee, top-level employees. Mm -hmm. And I've, my understanding is now you, you have unilaterally made the decision that 8.34, whatever the FRS reimbursement rate is appropriate for my three counterparts that take the plan. How, I mean, we have, we have studied around the state. There are other entities, municipalities that do the same program with various rates. Most of them, some of them are above the FRS uh, equivalent of what these gentlemen. So how can you unilaterally do that? Again, I, and I get back to this. I'm not defending, and I want to say this for any, uh, for the cartoonist and the PNJ. I'm not defending a 50% return. It's a separate issue. For me, it's the principle. This is a valid contract that the, that the board entered into in 2016 before I got on the board. And I think we're, if there's a problem with that amount, which I'm hearing reasonable people say, well, maybe there is. That's our problem to solve. It does not change the fact that there's a contract that this board put in, into effect. You're not saying it's illegal. You won't say it, but you said it before. Your lawyer did too. Um, it's just really, it's sloppy. It's sloppy up here. That's our, if there's a, if there's a court of public opinion that thinks the 50% is too much, I agree. But that's separate from whether or not this contract is legal and whether or not this local 401A is legal. We, I mean, we've done our part. I think the next step that needs to be taken, and let's just, let's figure this out right now, because there's no need to let the media fight the battle. We're up here talking, we're adults. I think we jointly, you, your office, our lawyer, this board needs to get an opinion from the Attorney General. Let's do it, a joint request for an opinion, and let's get past this. The, the reimbursement rate that these guys get, we'll fix that if it needs to match the senior level employees or if we need to adjust it, you know, but. Meanwhile, we have to preserve our ability to contract. That's our ability, that's our right. This other stuff is, is, is people operating outside their lane. So, so Madam Clerk, would you agree to that? Let's jointly request an opinion and put this behind us. We've got important work to do. Would you, would you support that? Let me comment. First of all, you're mixing two issues. Your uh, contract with ICMA is legal. Your contract and any rate you set. I never said it wasn't, ma'am. I'm sorry. I never said it wasn't. I said you have constructively class, voided it. I have the floor. For senior <laughs> class employees are about county budget. You can put whatever percentage you want to put in there. I am only addressing that which elected officials receive. That is the only issue on the table for me mm. at that time. I didn't, I did not stip, I didn't say that you said the contract was illegal. You're saying the reimbursement rates are illegal. That's what you and Cody said when Correct. I pressed you. I, I will stand but, behind that. And, and, but by doing that, you've constructively voided the contract in terms of these, these gentlemen who no, are in the sir, plan. I've stopped the contribution rate well, from 50%. You can, you could split hairs. You could split hairs if you'd like, but That's you constructively. That's a lot of money for hairs. Well, you could split hairs if you'd like, but you've constructively avoided it. Will you join us in requesting a joint opinion? No, I will not. I do you not, not need an attorney general's <laughs> opinion. We're trying to solve I can an issue. Read this, I can read the statute, sir. Yeah. If we need to move this to a court. I'm trying to I avoid I'm trying to avoid that. Well, it may not be avoided. Okay. All right. Well, gentlemen, again, Robert, you know, 
this is this is your issue. This is Stephen and Lumen's issue. But for me, the issue is this board contracts. If it's a legal contract, the clerk does not have the right to constructively void it, which she's done. So, if you guys want to fight it, whatever you want to do, you'll have my complete support. Because we're apparently a more, uh, you know, a better way to forward is not going to be acceptable to her, according to what she just said. Thank you. And then I guess my question is, Madam Attorney, in all our conversations that we've had, have we? found anything that supports the clerk's claim that this is outside general? Uh, under home rule powers, you have the authority as the Board of County Commissioners of a non-charter county to do anything that is not inconsistent with general law. The outside opinions we've gotten so far have, I mean, you've seen them. They, they say what they say. I have uh, previously offered to counsel to the clerk to request a joint attorney general's opinion and was also said that they would not join. I have asked the attorney general's office and they will not wait in on behalf of one party. They won't do it if there's um, a contested matter between two agencies or offices. So that's not available to us as, a, as an avenue. So, I mean, Pam, why can't we, we just jointly request the attorney general's opinion? I have a feeling where we'll get stuck is how you present the issues and how I present the issues. Work on it jointly. Let's work on it jointly. Let us vote on it. You bring the language, we'll vote on it. How's that? No, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm, I'd like to try to get this solved without having to go to court. Me too. Um, you know, because- I tell you what, Allison can write something up as to how she would present it and we'll sit down and have a conversation. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Barry. Yeah, I was just going to mention just because I was I was I was mentioned, um, Madam Clerk. I, I, nobody has put words in in your mouth about the illegality. You had said that many. You had said that multiple times that the plan was illegal. So that's not hearsay nor uh, somebody you know putting words into your mouth. You uh, had said multiple times and in, in, you know verbally and what's been quoted in the paper as well as uh, as well as an email. Um, you know as recently as a few weeks ago that that the illegality of the of the plan. So that, that is what you've said previously. If you're not saying it's illegal now, that's, uh, I mean, I think that is a little bit of a different, a little bit of a different opinion, but um, uh, just to be clear, nobody is putting words other than what has been previously said. Commissioner Underhill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I will say this is one of those things, there's, uh, there's, there's those three layers that we always have to think through when we talk about uh, uh, handling uh, the other, other, other people's money and the other, not just the money, but also the decisions that we make here on this board. Um, there's what is legal, ethical, and moral, um, you know, and there's, uh, some of those are, are pretty well set in stone, legal. Uh, ethical uh, is very well set by, uh, mostly by precedent, and moral is really between you and your God. Um, and those things can be very different between you and me. Um, when I came on board here, I refused to sign anything that would uh, to accept a uh, retirement uh, because morally and ethically, I do not believe that elected officials, representatives in particular, um, should receive any kind of a, uh, a retirement plan. Now, I know that that's not popular, um, and I know that even though I consider that to be unethical and immoral for us to enrich ourselves in office, um, it is perfectly legal. Um, it goes a lot along the lines of our discretionary funds. I think that spending our discretionary funds on things that aren't really, you know, that, that aren't really, you know, budgeted items for the county, not priorities for the county, um, I think that is a bad business practice. For myself, I, I consider that to be, uh, you know, a struggle on the moral and ethical side. But it is perfectly legal, and it is what this board has chosen to do. It's our practice here. Uh, and as a result, I do not comment on those. Um, you know, uh, the only way that I would ever vote against one of those is if I felt like it was actually an illegal use of the funds. Um, so, you know, I voted in favor of those all the time, even though for the entire time I've been on this board, I've been, you know, very much, uh, very clearly in opposition to that practice. Um, another very good example of that is the, when I was the chairman and Eager Beaver came and had a, a, a request before us. It's, this is, this action has stained my soul and will and it'll stick, be a part of my life forever because I treated the applicant no different than any other speaker, and I only gave them three minutes to speak. And in doing so, um, you know, which was, you know, you could say with, that was fair to do the same as everybody else, but I violated their rights. They took us to court and they spanked us for it, rightfully so. I unintentionally violated someone's rights. I say all of that to say this, Commissioner. When I looked at this, I knew there was something wrong with this and wouldn't have signed up for it because 
we're not supposed to get rich in these jobs. We're not supposed to be incentivized to stay in these jobs for an extended period of time. Third terms are always dangerous. You know, that's a, a very well-known axiom of, of politics. Um, so this is a prime example of the kind of thing that actually should be going to court. Okay? You have an elected constitutional officer saying that she does not, that she believes that this, what, that we, what we've done all along is outside of, of uh, um, the law, outside of general law. Uh, when she looked at it the first time, she didn't look far enough to say it was outside of general law, just as I didn't, just as I didn't think through with the eager beaver, just as we don't on many of these things. It's not until, at, and you know, just to, at that time, there weren't any commissioners engaging in it, which is really the issue now, whether we as elected officials have the, uh, uh, should be dipping into the pot like this. Um, you know, so coming back to review it now, in spite of the fact that she looked at it before and said it wasn't a problem, well, that's, that's, if you're in a leadership role for any period of time, you're gonna have to go back and revisit decisions you made before. There are things that we miss in our younger days that we now know more as experienced. You'll notice every time that there's ever an applicant up there, I ask the question, have you had the opportunity to say everything that you wanna say? That is specifically because of what I learned in the Eager Beaver thing. So I'm, I, I know more now as the, um, uh, as the clerk probably knows more now about her job than she did the first time that she looked at this. We assume these things to be legal, but in review of the information that's been put in front of us, uh, you know, I, I was always very strongly of the belief this is not moral or ethical for us to get enriched at this level. Um, but in review of the, uh, the, what's in front of us, I think it's very clear that it is also outside of general law. And there's no f need reason to fear going to court. To ask the Attorney General for an opinion in which two agencies are competing, you're asking the Attorney General to serve as a court. That's precisely the thing that should go before a judge, particularly when it's very clear from what has already been said that the way that we articulate, that the way that the Board of County Commissioners is articulating our, how we perceive the story and how she is perceiving, or articulating how she perceives the story, there is, there is a material difference in those two things. If I were in her role, I wouldn't sign on to a, um, a, a joint uh, argument either, a joint request, because that would be asking me to water down my argument to match yours or somewhere in the middle. And I'm not a believer that the truth is somewhere in the middle. <laughs> you know, there's, there's times when it's absolutely worth fighting. As far as getting a couple of attorneys to come and say what we, you know, that, that everything is legal, um, I think we've all been doing this long enough to know. Uh, I mean, at Rolling Hills guys, they got an attorney to say that it was illegal for me to talk about what they did to Wedgwood just because it was on social media and not here. And every judge that looked at it said, Pfft. okay, you can get an attorney to literally say anything. You can be a, a, a mass murderer and you will find an attorney to stand up in court and defend you because right. that's what attorneys do. And it does, I'm not, I don't mean that to be derogatory about their, their trade. That's what their trade exists to do, and our Constitution couldn't exist without it. But the fact that we paid people to give us opinions, your attorney is almost always going to give you the opinion that you're looking for. This, to, this is ready to go to court. It should go to court. And it gives us an opportunity to set in, in, uh, with judicial precedent or the judicial uh, judgment what is right, not just for Escambia County, but for all of Florida. So I would recommend that we do, in fact, go ahead and go ahead and, and put this in front of the judiciary and let them make the decisions uh, that they are wholly qualified. Now, the judges don't, they're not, they're not qualified to do, to do things like figure out a tree ordinance. That's what we're here for. <laughs> well. So, but it is time and this issue in particular, particularly because of what it does with regard to undermining the public trust and making us, making people believe that those of us in office are here for personal greed, this needs to go before a court and be judged. And those who, and, and let all, uh, whoever turns out not to be correct about this, let them be silenced by uh, the judge's uh, report from this. Thank you. So, yeah, sure, yeah, I mean, just for the record, I mean, I had no idea about this when I ran for office, so I didn't run for office or anything like that because of, of this, you know, just, Clear in the air. No, no, I, I don't think anybody reasonable right. would have would have assumed that. But but it is also true, and I mean we're actually watching it with a very good friend of mine who did a, a great job with the sheriff's office um, for for 12 years. Uh, somewhere in that process, he commissioned a statue of himself. No, this is a person I have a lot of respect for. 
But I tell you, any, any time that you're commissioning a statue for yourself, you probably need to surround yourself with better friends, right? I mean, I, I know my friends. I mean, I can only imagine how much Jonathan would mock me if I did. And I bring that up not to take an opportunity to, to grind an ax on somebody that I, that I have a great deal of respect for. I bring it up to say that third terms are historically and chronically dangerous, and this is why. We, do the, we, we come into office for one reason. Once we get in office, as you learned when you came on board, and all of us did, um, that the reality of being in a position of power is very radically different than what we thought we were running on. And those who advised us, those who knew, they advised us when we talked about how busy we were during the campaign and how much the campaign s sucked out of you, the people who knew better said what? They said, you think the campaign's hard, wait till you get the job. Okay, so n of course, Commissioner Bender, nobody ran for office, nobody that I'm aware of in our peer group ever ran for office to enrich themselves. But the actions with regard to this 401A, and in particular going to Tallahassee without telling the rest of us that we were working on it, this is the kind of thing that creates massive fissures of trust between the people and those of us who are here to represent them. The only way to begin to heal that fissure of trust at this time, in my opinion, is to take this and put it before a court where all of the emotion gets extracted and only the facts are used to determine the judgment. Sure. So I'm just trying to avoid more cost to the citizens. You know, if the issue is the the percentage amount, I'm fine. That's why I didn't vote for it when it when when we asked her to continue paying it. Right? I, I didn't sign up to to get 51 percent. You know, um, all amounts that are set by the state. Right? I mean, that the state sets the amount of F FRS. We just said in the contract that I don't know. Were you on the board when it voted 2014, 2015? When it 14? Okay. In 16, maybe, yeah. And, and, and again, voting for, voting for it based on that everybody around, or all staff was saying this is the way it's done. Sure. And, and a neophyte reading it uh, could recognize it as, um, as you know, being okay. Uh, but I think what we know now is that it actually did create an enrichment, a greater enrichment for those of us in elected office. Now, if it was just about the, um, uh, about the staff, senior staff members, uh, as was often said, now we've dropped the matter now, and so I guess those senior staff members decided, or maybe they just didn't materialize, but if it was, if this is about elected officials. Um, so, and I'm sorry, I, you. I right. didn't mean to interrupt so, you. So all I was saying was that if it's, if it's about the percentage, if that's what we want to boil down to and, and revisit that, I'll revisit that anytime, and, and that's the thing. But, but to, to be accused that I've taken part in something illegally, as I was, I, I take offense to that because when I was given the onboarding paperwork by HR, I investigated, I read it, and I made my decision based on what I had determined. And then mm -hmm. when, I, when it came to be something different, I asked for a clarification because it wasn't what I was told, and I thought it was, you know, yeah. it was too much. Yeah, uh, and, uh, and so if we want to focus on that, then let's focus on that. But, but I think we're, as Jeff said, you know, we're sort of kind of conflating the two. And, 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 yeah. and, and I think the clerk did a great job of articulating that. If you make a mistake, if you're out, so operating outside of law, out of ignorance, um, that's not necessarily illegal. But once you are shown that there's a reasonable, pop, or that it's outside of general law, or if there's a reasonable possibility it's outside of general law, then the right thing to do is to go back into what is clearly inside of general law and let a judge make a decision. Um, that, that's, I think the only part of it that would make it illegal is if after a significant body of evidence has been presented that it may in fact be outside of general law, we continue to do it. At that point, I think is what the clerk was saying, at least that's how I understood her statements was, we went from being out, that would take you from outside of general law to intentionally illegal. Um, and, and that's, uh, uh, with that understanding, uh, the decision to go in front of a court. I mean, the amount of money saved it, it, it is it, the, the, the savings of money thing part about going to court is, is often used. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because I think you settle this one time uh, and really the greatest debt that we're creating right now is not financial. It's a trust deficit. And there's I, I no agree. cost that we should not pay to mend a trust deficit with the people of Escambia County. I, I mean, like I said, I want to be a good steward of the dollar, so I mean, if we can do it without going to court, then I, I would much rather do that. So, Commissioner Robert, Robert we, we can play these political games all day. Yeah. I mean, until when he first looked at it, he thought it was wrong. 
So you didn't sign it. You automatically went to FRS. Then you reaffirmed it in 2016. This is a political game that has went way too political. No one is sitting here self-serving to make money. Look, and if you would do your research and understand why that program was implemented, because if you stay in FRS like some will do, uh, you will be able to get your retirement for 30 years like most employees. And then when you die, your wife will get it. This is actually a cost savings to taxpayers because elected officials, as Doug said, are not intended to be here 15 or 20 years. The actual dollar amount is the same amount. It's the narrative that has been put out politically uh, to make someone look bad. If we took the dollar amount of the retirement that goes into the clerk or any other constitutional, that dollar amount would be more than the dollar amount that we get. It's just that it's not going in the FRS to be there in perpetuity. It is for short-term people. That's why that was for legislators and judges. And, and we talk all this 50%. Talk the actual dollar amount. I agree. Let's go to court. Let's get the attorney general. Let's get the analytics and say exactly what does it cost the taxpayers in actual dollars and stop playing with the political narrative of percentages that is not helping our community at all. No one wants to get it. I mean, we all are able-bodied people that can go out and earn a living. And so no one is serving. You can't pay a person enough to come and serve in a political <laughs> A position for all the anguish that their family goes through. But this political game that's being played is not helping our community. Move forward, as you said. Take it to the courts. I agree with that. Take it to the courts. Get an opinion. But tell the truth to the citizens. The actual dollar amount is a cost savings to the average citizen. Because when you go into that program, you're not being paid beyond your time of service, like you're doing in your FRS, that you can be paid for 50 to 60 years. And so when you do that, and I give all those who were there when they implemented this program, the vision to know that short-term, yeah, that number may be up. And I'm not, I don't care about the 50% or 2% or 